Is the camera ready when Judy gets back here? Cool. Are you filming now? As we're, oh, okay. Are we, are we running live? Oh, good. I always like when that happens. Uh oh, all the gossip. <laughs> Come on, Dean, keep it down. <laughs> wow. hello, hello. I, I, I couldn't eat the camera. <laughs> What was it Lily Tomlin used to say? Is this the party to whom I am speaking? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're ready. We will call the meeting to order. This is the March 16th meeting of the Yellow Springs Village Council. And can you all hear me loud and clear? Good. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Wintrow. Here. Sims. Here. Housh. Here. McQueen. Here. Lori Askland is out of town this evening. Also present is uh, Village Manager Patty Bates, Assistant Village Manager John Young, Sergeant Knapp is somewhere, thank you, um, and Village Solicitor Chris Connor. Thank you. Um, we have a lot going on this week, um, so hopefully you all have your schedules cleared for Thursday and, or Wednesday and Thursday, uh, Thursday, March 18th, we have a public forum with HNTB, who is our um, design build consultant for the water plant. And it will be, I'm sure there will be a review of what's happened to date and uh, the project generally, but it will be mostly a discussion on water softening options. That will be, as I said, Wednesday night between 7 to 9, and it will be in A and B. And then the next night um, at 7, uh, Thursday the 19th, HRC will have a community forum um, on um, policing and the, uh, I think most specifically, the task, task force, force. And, and village participation in the task force. That will actually be down in the gym, and that's again at 7 o'clock. And, and I'll just add, sorry, uh, oh, sure. free child care. Uh, so the Brian Youth Center is always there to provide child care for any parents that need that. And then on March 30th, we will have a joint meeting with my, the Miami Township trustees. We haven't done that in probably about five years. And that will be in rooms A and B also again at 7 o'clock. Uh, any other announcements? I actually wanted to announce that our local Girl Scouts are still selling cookies <laughs> until the end of March. And I said I would give them a shout out because you may remember I, I brought some for council. Thank you. you. I was going to ask. Did you um, get any? Because you may remember that our local Girl Scout troop helped uh, clean out the amphitheater and the Yellow Springs Creek, and, and we were really thankful for that. So uh, Nan Meekin mentioned that you can give her a call. She's in the Red Book, and uh, her number's 2093. Uh, anything else? OK. Um, Next is a review of the minutes from the March 2nd meeting. Uh, comments on page one, page two, page three. I had a, a comment, and um, it's at the last uh, sentence. Uh, is this on page three? On page three. OK. It's regarding Sam Young's um, talking about his concerns about the utility bills. And I wasn't sure that the last phrase was accurate. Let's just The, the, the last it. phrase says that he was implying that the, um, that the uh, communities that, were, that responded to the survey were handpicked for a favorable response. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't recall enough to know if that's kind of an editorial comment that could be considered, I think, if he didn't. I mean, uh, if, he, if he said that he thought they were handpicked, that's one thing, I guess. But, um, well, I guess the word favorable is the... Pardon? <clears throat> I guess the word favorable is the one that is a question, because he did indicate that he felt that they'd been handpicked for a in particular, order to get a particular response. Correct. Well, you could interpret that as favorable okay. or less than favorable, but um, I can take out favorable. And if I can finish up that one, I have one. Um, on the um, one, two, three, four, five, the paragraph that talks on page three that talks about um, the delinquency notices and how those are sent out. Um, it says that there was there's a 30-day notice provided before shutoff and the delinquency uh, must be brought to the person, the attention of the person residing at the property. What happens is 
the bill due date is the 15th. The, when the next bill goes out, which is around the first of the month, um, the end of the month, the first of the month, it is marked delinquent. They have until the next bill date of the 15th to pay, and then they get a seven-day shutoff. Correct, Melissa? So I just wanted to clarify that process. So there's a 21-day, essentially, notice? Yes. Okay. But I, I mean, I don't you usually go back and listen to the audio just to, to clarify that what's in the minutes is what was said? Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify the process. Page four. Page five. Page six. Page seven. Page eight. And page nine. I have a motion for approval. So move. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is a review of the agenda um, for the meeting tonight. Is there any? Um, is there any? Uh, any? Any additions or changes to the agenda? That, nope. Okay. You, did you need to add an executive session this evening? We need an executive session, yeah. correct? Okay. And for the purpose of? I was guessing. Okay. And that was my error. I believe Chris had let me know about that. Okay. Um, Lori is not here, and Lori is our person who um, reviews the petitions and communications. I will try to do that. Um, we received letters from John Hudson, um, Judith Hempfling, Helen Iyer, and John and Segalia Cannon um, about utility delinquencies. Um, Helen was recommending that we um, maybe form a committee to come up with some policies. Um, the other three were all um, opposed to um, any change in the current policy. Um, let's see, Betty Kelly wrote a letter in reference to economic development, and uh, Kate Hamilton wrote two letters about the roles and responsibilities document um, being proposed, both in opposition, and Corey Johnson wrote another one in opposition. Um, in the online packet, um, the mayor's monthly report, um, some events um, that are happening. Um, I think I'm actually going to turn turn some a couple of those events over to to Brian. Um, but Green Cats, I just did want to let you know. I sent this to Judy that Green Cats has um, stopped the Purple Line, which was the late night um, mm -hmm. uh, bus. So that's not happening anymore. Um, let's see what else. I think that's it. I mean, the others actually are related to Brian. There might be things that Brian could elucidate. Yeah. Um, well, uh, we are having the conflict resolution training. That press release uh, was in the packet, um, which is uh, a collaboration with Village Mediation, Dayton Mediation, and uh, I think there's some still sp some spots available. Um, the HRC just had the agenda included for the community conversation with Chief Hale this Thursday, and there will be agendas uh, at the session, which uh, Karen mentioned. Part of what we're hoping to get more input on is participation in the ACE task force uh, so that we can make the best policy decision about that. Um, the press release about the uh, Village Design Award uh, was in there, and again, we're always taking nominations for that. And uh, community access panel, uh, we just wanted to highlight thanking our few volunteers who do so much for the station, making sure that there's lots of programming on Channel 5 and that the meetings are online. So uh, thanks a lot. And the fiber forum's in there too, that's April 25th. And on our I, on our table and also in the, in the electronic packet was, um, the articles from the Dayton Daily News that uh, Christine Roberts had referenced a couple of meetings ago about marijuana cultivation and the um, bill that is anticipated to be on the ballot in November um, to legalize marijuana. Um, 
So next we're going on to public hearings and legislation. First we have the second reading and public hearing of Ordinance 2015-03, vacating an alley at the eastern edge of Marshall. And do you want this <clears throat> by title only? Sure. All right. Ordinance 2015-03, vacating the alley lo located east of Livermore Street between East South College Street and Marshall Street. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, John, would you please take a minute to explain this legislation? This is a ordinance to vacate an alley that is located on the uh, east side of Livermore Street between East South College Street and Marshall Street. Uh, it is currently, the area is currently occupied by the, the gym for Antioch College. And there was a planning commission meeting on December 8th, 2014, where the planning commission uh, recommended approval of the alley vacation to village council. And they found that the uh, alley vacation was in conformance with the requirements outlined in section 1224.02 of the Yellow Springs Code of Ordinances and uh, recommended that approval to you guys. Do you have any questions? Um, questions from council? Uh, this is a second reading in public hearing, so I will open the public hearing to questions or comments from citizens. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Uh, Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Sims? Yes. Wintra? Yes. Next, we have the second reading in public hearing of Ordinance 2015-04, approving a water rate increase, and let's read this entirely. All right, this is an ordinance amending Section 1046.02 Service Charges of Chapter 1046 Water of Part 10 Streets, Utilities, and Public Services Code of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. Whereas the Village Water Fund is the least healthy of the various village funds, and whereas foreseeable capital improvement requirements will further stress the resources of the Water Fund, and whereas scheduled rate increases established in 2014 are proving insufficient to fund the needs of the water utility, now therefore the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio does hereby ordain that. Section 1, this rate, the rate increase previously enacted on April 1, 2014 is hereby repealed. Section 2, in its place, a new rate to take effect on May 1, 2015 is hereby enacted as follows. <coughs> Monthly readiness for service charge, $6.80. Consumption charge per 1,000 gallons, $5.77. Section 3, this ordinance shall be in full force and effect at the earliest date permitted by law. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, Patty, would you please... Explain. Yes, this is a, a rate increase that is recommended by both Melissa and myself. 6% um, of this 10% increase will go to make the water fund um, break even, essentially, uh, at the end of the year. The other 4% was originally meant to be a um, bit of a cushion in there so that we could, uh, we could begin putting a little bit of money away for the water plant. Um, Melissa and I have talked and I've been in communication with Ken Heigel at the Ohio Water Development Authority um, and we could, if we so <coughs> desire, use a portion of the remaining 4% to pay for the water loop completion, um, which would leave the money that was appropriated out of the general fund for that project in the general fund and allow that loan to be repaid out of the water fund. And that is something that um, later <coughs> on you do have in your packets, a, uh, an analysis of funding for the water plant, and I do want to discuss that at okay. that time. Okay, thank you. Um, questions or comments from council? <clears throat> this is a public hearing. I will open the floor, <clears throat> floor to citizens' comments. <coughs> Excuse me, I shouldn't be eating a cookie. Um, <laughs> it's seeing coconut. and hearing none, <laughs> and it's coconut too, yeah. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Um, Judy, would you please call the roll? Mm -hmm. Sims? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintra? Yes. Uh, next item on the agenda <coughs> is uh, resolution 2015-09, declaring support for marriage equality. 
Right. Whereas village council desires to recognize the fullness of life that is expressed in the relationships of same gender and same sex couples, and whereas the Yellow Springs community has a long history of agitating for justice, <coughs> working for the abolition of slavery as a stop on the Underground Railroad, railroad <coughs> to active participation in the civil rights movement, to consistently being an open and inclusive community that values diversity and continues to welcome many LGBTQ citizens. And whereas the village of Yellow Springs in 2009 established a domestic partnership registry that prohibits discrimination or intimidation based on sexual orientation, and whereas unfortunately even as justice and equality sweep the nation, Ohio remains among a minority of states that do not permit same-sex couples to marry, thereby denying them the ability to protect and provide for their families while depriving them of the many legal, economic, and social benefits of marriage, and whereas Yellow Springs Village <coughs> Council will continue to speak out for equality and justice as we eagerly await the day when Ohio takes its place on the right side of history, and whereas Village Council wishes to show support for marriage equality and appreciation for the work of Hawaii Marriage Matters Ohio, now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio that Section 1, Yellow Springs Village Council hereby declares its support for full equality and protections for the LGBTQ community and recognizes the vital con contributions lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender persons make to the local economy, cultural life, and government of our community. Section 2, Council hereby expresses its full and unqualified support for marriage equality and its appreciation for the work of Why Marriage Matters Ohio. Section 3, this resolution shall go into effect at the earliest period allowed by law. Can I have a motion, please? I move. Second. Thank you. This is one of those um, times when it makes me proud to be able to sit here and uh, talk about something like this. Um, it's uh, it's long time, past time for the state of Ohio to get with it and um, do what's right. So I'm hoping that as more communities pass legislation like this, whether it's just a symbol or not, that they will understand that that's um, what the majority of citizens in the state of Ohio are interested in. I also wanted to say that um, we got an email from Dave Fobert today, and there was a, um, he signed um, an amicus brief on marriage that went to the Supreme Court. It was a group of mayors, joined 225 other mayors in signing on to a friend of the court brief urging the Supreme Court to end marriage discrimination nationwide. The brief includes mayors from towns as small as Thompson, North Dakota, to the and they didn't say Yellow Springs, I don't know why, to the largest five cities in the nation. <clears throat> so um, this is, you know, this is obviously getting a lot of a lot of press and a lot of interest in the around the country um, in this kind of legislation. So um, any other comments? Yeah, I I'd like to say something. <clears throat> oh. It was called to my attention by one of the Yellow Spring <coughs> citizens that Athens, Ohio had passed a similar resolution and so uh, Columbus has also. So we, I think we'll be the third community in Ohio that's passed the resolution. And um, Chris Geggy from Why Marriage Matters Ohio had mm -hmm. hoped to come to our meeting and uh, he got ill and he can't come. but. Uh, he says, please give my sincerest thanks to everyone and thank you for taking a lead on this. We will win marriage equality and we will do it because of people like you. Yours, Chris. We also had, I'd also like to just note that Carmen Milano had sent a letter to council um, <laughs> saying that um, she and her partner Bronwyn will be getting married in Indiana in April. They would have liked to have gotten married here. And this got good coverage from the Dayton Daily News. And um, also, um, Dayton Daily News has a new website. If you, Sharon, who is Dayton Daily News reporter who usually covers our meetings, has started a new Facebook page called The Green 90. So she's posting a lot of information about things that happen in Green County, and she's posted it on there. Um, any, one other thing. Mm -hmm. uh, under Section 1, I noticed that the, although Judy said it, the uh, Q after LGBT was was left off. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will. I will add it. Yes, I caught that as I was reading it. Thanks. Any comments from citizens? Everybody. S signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Aye. I don't know what my problem was on that one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, the council goals, I don't know if that, um, 
we weren't necessarily expecting those to be um, on the agenda. Um, we were going to kind of review them again, but um, in agenda planning, when we went through them, um, it seemed like they were in order. People had, had provided their additional input. Jerry had provided some additional input. So Judy and I talked about just going ahead and putting it on the um, in for um, legislation and um, seeing what council, if council was in favor of, of passing it or doing it tonight. Is that, do we want to go ahead and read it as legislation? Is that yeah, okay I with have, everyone? Okay. I, I have a couple. Of but we can do that after we read okay. it as legislation. Okay. So, okay, cool. Judy, would you? Indeed. Okay. <clears throat> this is adopting village council annual goals for 2015. Whereas the village council adopts goals to guide decision making and resource allocations of the village, and whereas the village council has collaborated in public as to the aspirations, needs, and vision for the community, and whereas the village council has sought input from the community in goal setting for 2015, now therefore the council for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby resolves that section one. Council has identified the following values as the as the basis for their 2015 goals. Value number one: deep in decision making processes with active citizen par participation and effective representative governance. Value two, be an excellent employer and provider of services within a responsible fiscal framework. Value three, be a welcoming community of opportunity for people of diverse races, ages, sexual orientations, cultures, and incomes. I feel like I'm at my grandma's house. <laughs> value four, pursue a strong economy that provides diverse employment, a stable tax base, and supports the values of the community. Value five, seek in all our decisions and actions to reduce the carbon footprint of the community and encourage sound ecological practices throughout. Value six, provide careful, creative, and cooperative stewardship of land resources. Section two, this 2015 council goals as detailed on the attached exhibit A are hereby approved. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, so we ended up with, with five top goals for the year. Um, the first one relates to water projects. It would be the, the water plant, the bottleneck project, and the um, wellhead protection plan. Um, the second one is creating a sustainable economic development strategy to support existing businesses and entrepreneurs and attract new opportunities that support the values of the community. Third is develop a strategy for fiscal sustainability. Four is decide a strategy for sidewalk repairs and new construction. And then five is plan for tax levy for 2016. And within each one of those goals, there are anticipated results, goals and objectives, activities required to reach the goal and objective, a time frame, the people responsible and the resources required. So this is a pretty well thought out um, uh, plan for, how, for our goals for 2015. Um, Mary Ann, you had comments? Yeah, I wasn't <coughs> here in the interim time between last council meeting and this, so mm -hmm. I couldn't. But um, I have some uh, things that I would like to add, and I think there's one one error. So okay. should I go? Go ahead, yeah. Those? Okay. Um, so under the water project goal number mm -hmm. one, I'd like to add the environmental commission. Okay. Since it will be working on the wellhead protection plan. Um, and... Under goal six, uh, Tecumseh Land Trust was listed as a resource, but I think that probably should be under goal seven, which is uh, in regard to the green space fund. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, and um, in goal two, uh, all right, regarding sustainable economic development, it lists the Smart Growth Task Force, and I'm not sure that that exists. Right. That, yeah. Actually, I think it's it's the uh, well. I wrote that, so it's the report that we have on our oh. website. So oh, those were all those are all written okay. resources. Okay. Okay. Smart. The, so if we just okay we add the word report. Yeah. Yeah. And then in goal six, <clears throat> which is uh, regarding um, uh, lowering our energy mm -hmm. uh, use. Um, I would like instead of the Tecumseh Land Trust, I, I think it would be appropriate to ask to add the Climate Action Planning Group because that's a key focus of that group. Okay. Um, and the last goal, number nine, uh, I, I, think, I think that what we want to do regarding the parks is, is more than just youth programming. And I noted that the Environmental Commission was listed as a resource. 
so I, I think it's also about environmental stewardship as well as um, youth having the most effective use of our parks for everyone not just youth so I, I didn't really change the wording in there but I would be willing to tweak it a little if that's okay well if you can add something now we can pass it as well such. would you be Marianne, would you be more comfortable if the word youth just came out and it we could take planning yeah, and support for more for programming yeah. and I don't know whether we are really expanding the parks department are we doing that not I don't, until the budget gets well all now that we want to commit ourselves to expanding it um, that maybe but, I would cut that word out too. well it, it, you could expand the programming okay yeah not necessarily the personnel so mm -hmm. yeah I think maybe that was the say, intention expand programming for the parts yeah. department and then take mm -hmm. out the word youth and programming where it exists and then at the end add I was going to add uh, either into the goal statement or that next item which is uh, anticipated results include environmental stewardship mm -hmm. okay so, so can we go over what goal nine looks so like now the expand programming uh, for the parks department mm -hmm. in collaboration with community members and organizations to include arts and culture okay we could either say and environmental stewardship there or put it under the results either or both yeah um i like it in I mean, the goal, goal. i yeah, think that's I think nice and the idea was you know we had talked about this might be a good collaboration between the two commissions so did you get that so it's going in under the goal and coming out of anticipated results environmental stewardship mm -hmm. yeah. okay Okay, do we have final language? Wanted to read it. Yeah, just read it. Read this section? Uh, just, you, want just me to, the, you want me to do just it? Just goal nine. No, I better, I mean, if I don't have it, we're all in hot water. <laughs> <laughs> Expand Parks Department programming in collaboration with community members and organizations to include arts and culture and environmental stewardship. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, any other comments from council? I guess I would like to say, I. I noted when we were talking about our goals that um, at least one person one uh, citizen suggested that uh, <clears throat> there wasn't as much public involvement as they would like that that uh, the goals it was sort of hard to find the goals so I, I would like to say that for next year I would I would like it for, for us to uh, find a way to be more public both in terms of what we're putting out as goals and in terms of seeking goals and comments from the public we had a press release in the paper asking for goals input from citizens um, so I mean there and and it's been on a lot of agendas I mean I agree we try to do as much as we can um, to, to get input I actually need one of those thank you um, okay um, so any other comments any comments from citizens Okay. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And next is resolution 2015-11, approving a then and now for the first quarter of 2015. All right. <clears throat> Whereas the finance director has two pending invoices exceeding $3,000 for services delivered prior to obtaining certification from the fiscal officer that funds were available, and whereas both sections 5705.41 of the Ohio Revised Code and Village Policy require prior certification of the availability of funds for major per per purchases, sorry, and whereas the ORC provides an exception allowing retroactive certification when the requisite funds are available, both at the time the purchase commitment was made and when the payment is due, known as a then and now certificate, and whereas the finance director states that sufficient unencumbered money is and was <coughs> available both at the time the purchase was made and at the time payment was due for the obligations listed below, Village of Yellow Springs, $7,755.89, and Village of Yellow Springs, $7,309.58. Now, therefore, the Council of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, does Ohio does hereby resolve that. Section 1, the finance director is hereby authorized and directed to issue then and now certificates 
for the obligations listed above and to pay them from the appropriate accounts upon receiving properly executed then and now certificates. Section two, this resolution should be in full force and effect immediately upon passage. Thank you. Um, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, I am very confused by the fact that we are <laughs> owing ourselves this money. So could you explain that? Uh, I can. We bill ourselves for utilities. Oh. And we we didn't open a purchase order be, because it wasn't the way it was done until we got our audit that said, remember part of the audit was that we have to open a purchase order for even five cents. And so um, normally we would take it out, bill ourselves and then pay ourselves back within the system and now we have to do it then and now, which we didn't realize until we went to pay ourselves back. So. Um, okay. That's essentially it. And there is a typo in the second whereas. It is availability of funds for major purchases, not purposes. Yeah, you sure. said it I right. Know. I fumbled there. Yeah, you said it right, <laughs> but serious it's wrong in there. Yep, I got it. So, Melissa, do you have anything else you want to add to that? I know how much everybody loves them and now, so that was my goal this year not to have yeah. a single one. <laughs> Um, as a result of the last audit, it's been a huge learning curve because we never had to have purchase orders for any of our own utilities and um, the people that are doing our audit for the next five years, I've been in communication with them and it took weeks to get this answer and they actually had to go to the state to be able to clarify it because the language was written so loosely in the ORC. So that contrib contributed to the problem was because it took so long to get an answer about utilities because utilities are such a vague um, situation in terms of the ORC and the requirements for uh, village finances. So it is what it is, and now we know what we have to do to move forward. So that. And I was, I don't know what I was, why I was looking at some other municipalities' agenda, but I saw that they had then and now certificates. So it's, it's, you know, pretty common yeah. that municipalities have to do then and nows. Um, any other comments from citizens? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. I know it didn't seem that it was working. Does it have to be? John, it's the, just press and hold. Yeah. Now, now it's working. working. Okay. Thank you. So now is the time in the agenda uh, where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. Um, we ask that you keep your comments to three minutes, that you come to the podium and state your name. And since I didn't say so before, um, please turn off your cell phones. Um, any citizens' concerns that are not on the agenda? Okay. Um, we will move on to... Um, we have no special reports this evening, so we'll move on to old business, um, discussion of utility policy and procedures. Um, I will turn this over to staff for um, discussion. Okay, I think that I would like to start with Melissa's presentation. She is going to do a recap of the presentation she did, I think, three or four meetings ago. And then we'll get into the further discussion about the um, the draft policy with Chris, uh, I believe he has a public policy statement, and then we also have the procedure. Okay. Okay. Um, what I did was I had heard about some of the, the comments and the questions and things, so I decided to kind of go back and I did a, a two-page um, review. The first part of it, it, the first part of it is a history and overview that basically says, you know, we've had this debt, it's been on the books, it's been unaddressed for a really long time, that's why it is still on our books, it should not be on our books, but it is. So the fact that it is, um, that data is there and I have to present it. Um, the second paragraph um, talks about our audit. In 2012 and in 2013, there was a very specific comment in our audit about our delinquency issue and the fact that it needs to be addressed and they there is a direct quote in there from the audit that says these are you know some of the ways that you guys can kind of address it and it did um, bring up the fact of holding um, well actually not holding let me take that back um, <coughs> writing them off um, and submitting them to the county auditor to be assessed against property owners 
Um, and I expect this comment to be on there until we have some sort of formalized policy regarding dealing with our utility delinquencies, no matter what it is. Um, but we, we do need to really get that taken care of because my goal is to have a clean audit. I've got a lot of work ahead of me, and this might not happen for a while, but it is my hope to have a clean audit. So then I go through the recommendations. I had presented uh, six different options. Council was supportive of three of them which were holding property owners responsible for debt incurred at their property, continuing to annually assess property taxes, and refusing a customer service at a property until any debt is paid. I will say um, I did just this past week get our settlement, our first half settlement statement of property taxes from the county auditor. And there were, um, I think, four properties that we assessed last fall mm -hmm. since the county auditor only allows us to do it once a year. And we got 75% of our money back already that was paid in the last half of 14, or the first half of 15, I should say. So we did get that money back that we did um, assess to the properties that were occupied by property owners. So um, the next section is support of the council recommendations. This basically goes through all the research that I did. Um, the city of Xenia, I had started researching this topic um, from from my my start, um, which was the begin the end of uh, 2013, because I seen that you know we weren't really doing very much to kind of minimize uh, this, and that there was a little bit of work that we could do, and I had sent a survey out to or a question for inclusion in a survey um, that's ran it's a group that's ran by um, a lady that works for the city of Xenia. And it goes out to basically um, my peers, um, people that work in finance departments for municipalities. And so that was totally random in terms of um, how those were selected. I was totally out of that. I just sent the questions, and she sent it to her email list, and that's how we got those responses. So it wasn't even sent by myself. I just asked the questions, and it was sent out. Um, and then a, civil, a similar survey was sent out to AMP. I had reached out to AMP, this was a, a while ago as well, asking, you know, what other AMP municipalities had done, and they gave me um, the survey results that are in packet, and that was a result of an earlier survey, not even one that was provoked by me, because a lot of people ask the same questions. and. If I wasn't part of the group at the time, the question was sent out. Instead of sending it out again, they just send the compiled answers from those previous questions that were asked. Um, so uh, of the AMP communities, which stands for American Municipal Power, which provide electric utilities, it was 82% of those communities um, did have policies that held pro property owners responsible. So then I got even more curious um, because of the, the concerns that were raised over that Xenia survey. What I did was I was looking at different ordin ordinances on American Legal, which is where our ordinances sit. And it's a really easy website to navigate. And it's got 100 and different, 125 different municipalities that are listed. Um, their ordinances are listed on that website. So I started looking a few around here, and then I was thinking to myself that that could be perceived as kind of picking and choosing. So Denise Swinger and I went through all 125 of them in a day. It really didn't take an incredible amount of time. It took us just a few hours, the two of us, but um, we did survey. We looked at every single person's ordinance, um, and we typed those results up, and those were also in the packet. Um, not everybody had very clear language, so I did extract, um, or they didn't have utilities at all. So out of the 125, 60 of them held property owners responsible, 46 didn't have utilities, 18 were undefined or didn't have any specific language, and there was one bad link. So I used uh, the 60 that had clear ordinances, which I've listed all the ordinances and the dates that they were passed. Um, which that was kind of a difficult thing to kind of extract because as ordinances change, they have different dates. So I was going by the earliest date because I didn't really know when these that particular section was passed. So 60 held property owners responsible and 18 were undefined or no specific language. So that's 78 total. So that would equate to 77%. So then um, I went through and I addressed any citizen concerns and questions. Um, Patty had given me a list after the last meeting. I'd gotten a ton of emails and a ton of calls. So I went through um, some of the things that were very common questions that were asked. A lot of people were very interested in the total amount that we billed out and um, of that how much 
how much debt we were talking about on an annual basis and it does equate out to a half a percent and I understand that that can be perceived as a very trivial amount by some people or a very small amount but on the flip side of that um, a, a, a lot of um, comments were made about um, the utility office not doing a good job but if you look at the flip side of that that means our collections are 99 and a half percent which I think is pretty good um, but it's it's my job to kind of look at ways that we can do things better and it's council's decision to figure out how we do that so um, some of the other things that were brought up were credit checks which I think um, Chris is gonna maybe speak to the credit check check aspect of that because of the legalities and whether or not we could have like sliding rates depending on um, a person's credit and if we could refuse somebody um, utilities if their credit wasn't so great um, so I'll let him speak to that or Patty um, and then the issue of affordability it would basically just mean our deposit would go away and would possibly shift to the property owner if they so chose to collect a deposit to cover the utilities um, and then finally people were interested about how many of these municipalities had electric and that was um, provided in the AMP survey that I had so that's kind of some of the additional research that I did trying to answer some of the questions um, and then I guess I will turn it back to Patty or if Can you I guys have questions one, for me. one question I think another question that was raised is um, if they use a credit card to pay their bill mm -hmm. can you hold mm -hmm. that card and charge the card at the end of if it, there's a delinquency in other words that, can you that, hold the information that um, that raises a number of security issues and it makes me uncomfortable um, just since we've started doing credit card processing there um, are still policies that we need to put in place in order to ensure security of credit card numbers anything that we write down we immediately shred we do not store any kind of credit card numbers um, the slips that we print out and have people sign or when they call in the slips that are printed out only have the last four on them um, it would kind of be like holding on to somebody's blank check and as accounts close um, that might not be a valid number credit cards expire on a fairly regular basis if you lose your card it is no longer valid that number and expiration date and code is no longer valid so I don't really see that as working especially if somebody's here for two three years I mean that credit cards likely to expire in that time or somebody could lose it and it just makes me really uncomfortable having that kind of sensitive information in our office um, just because of all of the issues with credit card security these days anyways okay um, these are we had trouble um, formatting uh, new copies of the Xenia survey and they are here if you would like Melissa to I, I know Miss Betty would like a couple um, and I don't know who else wants them. <coughs> um, so, Chris, do you want to address the public policy angle next, or? Sure. Okay. That's the uh, microphone. Oh, okay. Yes. The uh, Chris Connor, yeah. the village it's solicitor. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, First, what I'd like to do is uh, just talk about what I what I viewed my task to be, which was to discuss or to put together just some brief points on the public policy behind making landlords responsible. I was not looking at the other side of the equation. Uh, the, the landlords are here; they've been making their points, I think, rather effectively. Um, I, this is not meant to be in a, an all-inclusive list but simply to hit the highlights of what I've discovered in looking at the case law and looking at some other uh, materials uh, first the Ohio Supreme Court settled this issue in 1943 when it first was uh, presented to uh, that court uh, out of a case out of Hamilton County uh, we've already discovered that the vast majority of Ohio municipalities hold landlords responsible for tenants past due utility bills uh, the rationale behind the policy seems to be uh, the belief that uh, the landlords in a private contractual relationship have more leverage over the landlord-tenant relationship than the municipality. As a practical reality, uh, the municipality truly doesn't have much leverage other than to increase the amount of deposit which could have affordability issues in that context. 
Um, when you look at the amount of most delinquencies, and I, I haven't talked to Melissa about this, but it's, uh, but it's I, I think, an assumption on my part that most of the amounts that are owed by way of <coughs> delinquent tenant utility bills would fall into a category that it just simply becomes cost prohibitive to, to pursue litigation alternatives, whether it be small claims court or, or municipal court. Um, also, uh, uh, Melissa's report indicates that uh, the cost of using collection agencies results in a recovery of half of the money that's collected. And I think that even though that was last done, I think in 2006, 2007, the policies of collection companies haven't significantly changed. Um, the other part of it is, is that uh, within the context of the coercive powers that a landlord may have through the private contract, uh, those terms are included. In other words, you, tenants are responsible for the utility bills. Landlords are likely already doing their due diligence in the context of what the rent, whether or not they ought to lease to an individual because they've done sufficient background checks and that they can build into their model their own protections uh, that can uh, determine what the deposits ought to be in a given situation, et cetera. Um, additionally, under Ohio law, the statutes clearly indicate that landlords are obligated as a condition of being able to lease the property uh, to provide utilities. Uh, and that relationship arguably is one that flows between the landlord of the property and the village because that's a condition of being able to conduct the business as a landlord to lease to tenants. Um, <laughs> Now, some can argue uh, that, in effect, uh, not to have a policy of making landlords responsible would amount to a government subsidy. That, that's a policy question. Again, I, as a matter of legality, I, I have no opinion on that one way or another. Um, but fundamentally, I think one of the reasons why the village has historically had problems collecting these delinquencies is because there's simply no cost-effective way to do it, in part because tenants at times are transient. Um, they don't have assets that are readily attachable, uh, and they can be tough to track down. And when you look at the, the amounts in controversy, the amount of money that's owed, it, it's simply not cost effective to go to court. And so with that in mind, the legislature created, oper or created mechanisms by which um, the uh, municipalities can protect themselves. I also point out that in the Yellow Springs Ordinances uh, 1040.02, uh, the st statute that applies in this situation is Ohio Revised Code Section 735.29. And uh, our ordinance specifically addresses that section, which also includes the collection of water, sewer, and electric. Um, and it says the village may elect to collect under procedure specified by Ohio Revised Code Section 735.29. That includes, remember in the last council meeting I handed out the legislation that pertained to water and sewer. This also specifically includes electric and other utilities. So the, the fact is, is that the authority exists, the legislature's created it, the Ohio courts have said this is an acceptable practice, and so then it's a matter of determination by the elected body as to whether or not that's a policy that they want to enact in the community uh, where everyone lives. So that, that's all I have to say at this point. Chris, did you um, can you address the possibility of the sliding scale based on? Good question, Patty. Uh, the concern would be that uh, as, a, as a public entity, uh, as a municipality, we have an absolute duty to be, have equal opportunity, equal protection for everyone. I mean, we, the resolution that was passed tonight is a reflection of that concept and that value. Um, there would be ex potential exposure to the village, in my opinion, if we created a sliding scale based upon an interpretation of a credit report and a determination as to what a risk might be of an individual prospective tenant. Um, that relationship, however, that, that equal protection argument is different in the context of a private relationship between a landlord and a tenant, which is, I think is another rationale uh, behind the policy of holding landlords responsible for uh, the utility uses of their tenants. The question I have, Chris, as I was reading the, the uh, whole memo that you sent, it, it talked about uh, credit report, and then at the end, 
it kind of alluded to, <coughs> excuse me, that if we increased one based on the credit report, we'd have to increase everybody's deposit rate. Did I read that right? Or yes. Right? My interpretation would be that there's a matter of village policy. If you took the person who comes in with the absolute worst credit rating, the landlord is determined that, that he or she wants to rent to that individual, that would be the benchmark upon which the deposit rates would be set. So you would have to pick the highest possible rate, or probably the highest possible deposit amount, and that would be set for everyone who comes in in terms of what the deposit is, where the landlord could factor in different variables and different facts to create the, the surety for the utility use. And we have no way of, you're saying we can't, really can't refuse to provide service. No. Unless they owe us debt. Unless, the, unless that individual tenant is the person who will be named on the count and already owes you money. But a landlord can refuse to rent a property to, to anybody. If, uh, can assuming, uh, assuming that if they, they have to yes, yeah. comply with fair housing laws. Fair housing, yes. right, okay. Yes. Um, Let's see. Any other? We're gonna we're gonna talk here, Sam, before we get to questions. Question you, words. When I open up the floor. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to before we get into my part of it. I would like to um, address one um, thing that uh, in Melissa's report she did originally present six options to council. Um, council chose to move forward with three of them. Um, the other three were utilizing collection agency, send legal notification of debt owed with the next step of small claims court, which Chris has just indicated is not really fiscally feasible in a lot of cases, or reporting the names of customers to, in default to credit agencies. Um, Council did choose to not move forward with a credit a or a collection agency at this time, but I, Melissa did when she first came here, I believe, um, investigate that, and you didn't find <clears throat> anything substantially different from what it was when they did it back in 05 or 06, right? And that's that they keep 50 percent, right? There, there was, um, there was a number of different. <clears throat> I was getting cold called when I first started by collection agencies. I think one of them was one that we used in the past. And it just depends on their level of aggression. How serious are we about wanting to collect um, is what they base their um, level of effort on. And it could vary. There were some of them that were flat rates. Um, there were some of them that were um, like sliding scales, depending on how a person paid. I mean, there was a couple of different options, but it, it was still costly. And from everything that um, I had found down in my office and talking to Susie, who has a long history with the village, um, when we did use the credit, the collection agency, it was, it was really hard on staff and the community um, did not like the response that they were getting from the collection agency that we used. So they kept a lot of money and it sounds like they were in staff's hair and they really um, did not go over well with the community either with their level of aggression. Okay. okay. What are you going to talk about? Um, essentially all I was going to do was to indicate that my original report, mine and Melissa's, from two meetings ago or last meeting is uh, also in the packet and then to cover the um, the draft, um, the the account procedure. Um, one of the questions that was asked was, um, do we provide people who are potentially going to get disconnected with any options for payment? And we do have both of these documents downstairs. Um, this one actually sits out on the counter, and this one also is available. And these are all different agencies that can help folks pay their bills, their utility bills if they're behind. Um, other than that, the other, the only other thing I had was the procedure, which okay. is in the packets. If everyone wants to go over it, we can. Well, if we I don't, still, I, I just, I, one thing that confuses me is I'm still. I, I guess I would like to, to, to. I don't know. Maybe if you want to use, my, I brought my bill. I mean, I'm trying to understand the timeline of delinquencies and okay. exactly what happens when, and if you could even use dates and, um, you know, just to talk about. Um, what the process is because again you know what the comment I've heard and has been written and I've seen is that 
citizens feel that that we aren't and I'm I'm repeating what citizens are saying that they're that we're not adequately collecting and that actually if people felt that we were adequately collecting they would not have as much problem with this policy so could you just go through a step-by-step -step process of when the bills go out and how the whole thing happens to collect payment the bills are sent out to arrive in everybody's mailboxes on or about the first of every month the bill is then due on the 15th of the month our utility office is open from 10 to noon every day and then if the 15th falls on a Saturday we're open until 6 p.m. on the Friday before and if it falls on a Sunday then we're open until 6 p.m. on the Monday after so they were open tonight until 6 p.m. because today's the 16th 15th fell yesterday so then oh, what so they happens actually get another day an extra day yes okay. fall on a yes Sunday. yes depending on when it falls so anybody even though the utility office is closed right now anybody that's sticking their payments in the drop box out front of the building or downstairs that's next to the window those payments are collected tomorrow and all of those payments are processed and they are posted and the penalties are not posted until the following day's business because we actually give everybody an extra day so that is policy um, and so basically anybody that has their bill in the box right now even though we're closed it will be processed tomorrow and the penalties won't be posted until the next day it will be processed as if it came in today correct so like this month the penalties will be posted first thing in the morning on the 17th for anybody that hasn't paid the penalties equate to 5% of that month's unpaid portion so that does not compound if somebody has an unpaid balance that's two months old um, the penalty isn't compounded on that total it's only that current months um, is the 5% that it's applied to so if somebody um, doesn't pay their bill by the 15th the penalties are assessed for example this month on the 17th then the first of the month they will get their next bill so the first of April they will get their March bill and that will be marked delinquent um, yes I, 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 th I think that we've got a third party processor that does it so I don't see a lot of them as they come in they are supposed to be marked delinquent um, that processor has changed and we've had a few issues so whether or not they do to this day I'm not positive because we went through two billing cycles with that new okay. um, that new agency well the agency just shifted it's still the same agency but we've had some we've had some issues lately um, so it is supposed to be marked delinquent it would have their 30 days past due as of April 1st so if they didn't pay um, their February bill that was due March 15th then their April 1st bill would have their past due balance which would be 30 days um, that they had not paid and it would also have their new balance on there so they would have a past due balance and then they would have a current balance once the 15th of April would come if they still haven't paid that February bill then they would receive a disconnect notice and they have seven days on that disconnect notice in order to pay just that past due balance however if they are disconnected after that seven days in order to be turned on they have to pay their full balance so there are always two amounts on the disconnect letter there's always the past due amount and I actually just revamped the disconnect letter because um, one of the residents had called me and had taken issue with how it was worded and I took a look, another look at it and I totally understood how it was being confused so I revamped it and I made it um, much more clear than what it was before so it has been reformatted and it is a little bit clear so basically their disconnect notice would have two amounts on it it would have on it the amount that is 30 days past due and what they have to pay in order to remain on however if they do not make a payment at all and they are disconnected like I said they have to pay their entire balance plus a um, reconnection fee depending on what time our staff had to go out and reconnect them I believe it's twenty dollars if it's during business hours and I think it's thirty if it's outside I know it's definitely twenty if it's during the day but I think that it's thirty if it's after hours so in essence um, if somebody doesn't pay their bill they have until the next bill comes out the next bill is due plus seven days in order to pay that before they would be disconnected and Chris this is a little bit for you too is is that legally is that the legal requirement is that is that set those those dates is that set in our ordinance but, it but would our to ordinance be 60 is, days. It, is it state law Chris I mean does state law mandate those kinds of no. <laughs> uh, 
No. I, the, the, for example, in looking at these uh, over these things, uh, Xenia has a after a 30-day past due, there's a three-day disconnect notice that the landlord can initiate. <laughs> so the process that, that if the village wanted to pass some legislation, we can create what I'll call landlord-friendly procedures to uh, provide uh, protection to the landlords uh, if that's what is the desirable way to do it. In other words, we can tailor something that makes sense for this community. While you're standing up there, I'm going to ask this question. Um, the assessment to the property taxes, mm -hmm. that seems to be a step that some communities are taking. Can you take that step without having an ordinance that puts the requirement for paying the bills in the um, in the landlord's name. I mean, so if there is an outstanding utility balance in the name of a, of a tenant, can the village still assess that to the, to the property? I don't think so. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, when we, look, when we look at the ordinances that, that exist for the other communities, and I haven't done an exhaustive search of what the exact, they say, but the, the landlord needs to be on notice. In a, prior to that, that, that the ordinance is being interpreted or clearly is written that way. I mean, for example, I, I, when I look at Yellow Springs ordinance, I, I can make an argument that it, it, it already makes the landlord responsible, but it doesn't clearly say that. Uh, and so given the fact that we have an existing past practice, uh, I think that the landlords can fairly say that they are not currently, based upon how the ordinance has been interpreted, they're, they're not responsible for past due tenant delinquencies on utility bills. Okay. I have a question for Melissa. Um, if someone is delinquent, um, then the next month they get that notice. And then if they don't pay, they have the seven day. Is it possible for someone to be delinquent month to month and only just pay the delinquent? Mm -hmm. Half the time. And so they they're ending, they're always paying in arrears and they're always paying a certain they'll whatever. They'll pay enough to stay on and then the next month they'll be in the same position. <coughs> and do we have any, we have no recourse for that? I mean, if they're paying what they need to stay on, I mean, that's, that's we don't, our policy. So right? we, our policy doesn't require them to be up to date. Pardon me? No. Our policy does not require them to be up to date in no. their payment. They can, always, Just, they can always be a month past due and just pay the previous month's past due before they get disconnected. And then they're still a month past due, but they're only one month. But prior to the former village manager, it was 60 days. So that amount was much bigger. It would, yeah. it would be allowed to grow to a much larger amount before it was changed to 30 days. Right. So in the, we're, we're just talking about what we have now. Correct. Right. Um, mm -hmm. It, but I guess I would ask in the policy that is being suggested, would that be remedied? Or would that still be possible? I guess I would suggest well, I, that we... Well, I mean, the policy, <laughs> I would say that the policy can be written, if, if council wanted it to be a shorter period of time, you could. Um, there are a lot of people, not just in Yellow Springs, but in general, who run a month behind. Um, they just do. And it's, it's unfortunate because they're always paying late fees, but um, I mean, there are also a number of people that um, they work out payment arrangements with um, that run behind, but get it paid before the next bill comes out. I mean, um, it, it's, it's unfortunate, but there are a lot of folks who just run a little bit behind. They get caught up to the point they have to, to not get disconnected, but they always run behind. And Melissa, I mean, could you just explain what your recommendation is? Talk about what you're hoping to, to do to, to inform landlords and how you see it all. Um. Um, if landlords call or come down and they want to inquire about the status of a bill on any of their properties, I mean, they definitely have the right to know that. We've had, we have some landlords that, that inquire about that anyways. Um, so that information is available to the property owner. It's their right. It's their property. Um, they just just along just as well as usage. If they're curious as to what kind of usage is occurring, um, it's just like our water. Sometimes there are leaks, and those things aren't detected right away because they're red every three months. And 
sometimes the landlord may suspect that there's some sort of a leak and they might want their history of what the usage has been. I mean, we're more than willing to provide any of that information. And the way that we uh, talked about notifying the property owners um, of the delinquent status was when that bill goes out that says delinquent, that is supposed to be marked delinquent, we would give the property owner the option of either being notified by email at the same time or being notified by postal service. Um, and it's if you look at the procedure and the form, it actually has on there asking the property owner how they want to be um, notified and giving a space to provide us with an email address, which would be the fastest way um, that you would get an email. And it would just say, uh, please be aware that this account number, we would give you an account number, has gone into delinquent status. And, and there, there is an option. You're basically giving an option that, that the property owner could, could pay the bills themselves. They could get the bills and pay the bills themselves mm -hmm. or take it, I guess, take it to the tenant and say, you know, pay this bill, give me a check for this bill or they could continue to have it in the tenant's name. So the tenant could be continuing to write the check as is common now, but to me, I mean, basically still there's going to, there, there is the fallback of the property owner um, if there is a delinquency. The account would actually be in the property owner's name, but the bill would go care of tenant. Correct. Okay. If, if the landlord chose to operate. <coughs> right, if, if it were your property, Karen, it would say, Karen Wintro, CO, tenant, at 123 Zinga okay. Avenue or whatever. Um, Before we open the floor, any other questions? Regarding? Regarding you? anything that we've? I, I do want to point out one thing, and the question hasn't, hasn't really been asked. I mean, I think Chris was actually the one that asked me, um, was there an intention to hold property owners responsible for bills that their current tenants have? And the answer to that question is no. Those bills belong to the tenants. They, they don't, at this point, belong to the property owners. So there was never that intention. And it would also be, it wouldn't be an immediate thing. It would be phased in. If you, um, for instance, you know, if you have somebody who has a lease right now and that person stays for ten, two more years, you don't have to do anything until that lease expires or that person leaves and you lease it to somebody new. At that point, if you renew the lease, you would have to change it over or, you know, if, if someone else, if that person moves and someone else moves in. So it wouldn't be a immediately we're going to throw all this at you kind of thing. It would be phased in. And I think that's important for everybody to understand as well. I do have a question, Chris. Are we, <clears throat> can we refuse to hook up utilities if somebody does not have a signed lease for a certain period of time, our, say a year. Our ordinance actually requires documentation at this point. Can we legally Melissa? refuse? Oh, right, we don't know. right, but if. The, let, me, let me see if I understand your question. Are you saying do we have to see a copy of the lease moving forward if we want to hold the landlord responsible do in our legislation? No, I do we are do we have to be responsible for transient tenants like month to month leases oh, okay. where where you have a completely transient person who may be living in an apartment for a month they come and sign up and 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 we sign it up in their name are you asking me now yes or, or now. In the future I, I'm going to defer to Patty and, and Melissa on that because I don't know what I, mean, I, assu I assume um, if the, I are, assume if the tenant are, there came. There actually are some. Yeah. I would assume if the tenant came over and asked for signed up for services, and they gave the deposit that they would get it. No, we so. we, we ask for a copy of the lease yeah. because it's important for us to know who's living in that space. Um, however, we don't monitor how, when leases expire. That would take that would take quite a bit of work to go through all of our renters and figure out when their leases expire and making contact with either the tenant or the landlord. And there are a lot of people that are on a month-to-month -month basis. We just ran into this situation not too long ago where um, somebody had ran up a big bill and um, they had actually, this is, this is really sad that this happened, but the person ran up a big, a big bill, they were on a payment agreement, um, it got up to like $1,200 and they came in and they wanted a final out. They had their boyfriend come in, they had their boyfriend fill out a utility agreement they told us who the landlord was because they didn't have a lease. We called the landlord. 
Um, and the landlord basically said, I don't have a lease for them, they are on month to month, and was unwilling to provide us with anything, but did confirm that they were on a month to month lease, so we couldn't refuse that tenant service based on the debt from the previous tenant, which was actually still living there. And is still living there. Which is another part of the ordinance that we hope to clean up. I mean, that, I mean those are things that, you know, I'd like to, to know if there is, you know, if there are things that we can clean up about the ordinance we have, you know, I mean, because that just shouldn't happen. That kind of thing just shouldn't happen. But I would say this, that if that were the case, and you had two people living there, mm -hmm. the second person could always come in and say, I'm right. living there, let's put it in my name. <coughs> right. I, I think that's a common problem with any utility, right. regardless okay? of, of what okay. community you're in or who's so, the provider Yes, is. so when that person finaled out, just so everybody's on the same page, when that person finaled out, they had a $1,200 bill, but we had a $200 deposit. So we got $200, but there's still another $1,000 out there. So let's so oh, yeah, I have a question for Is it legal for someone to live in uh, an apartment or house without utilities? No. Without utilities? No. Okay. And then the other question would be, I guess, for Melissa and Patty. Well, well um, let, me, let, me, let me put a yeah, caveat there. Okay. If they're leasing, I mean, I won't go into if it's a private owner. If a private owner wants to live in their own property without it, they probably no, can. But, but in the context of landlord-tenant, the, the statute requires the landlord to have utilities available on the property. Okay. So the other question is, well, how difficult would it be to um, send the utility bill as a matter of course to both the tenant and the landlord? Just automatically send it. Uh, so that be very costly. So that It'd be very costly by the time you're generating two bills for every rental property in the village. What about if it were sent email to the landlord? I mean, I, one of the questions that was raised as a concern was if there's a leak and the tenant doesn't catch it and the landlord doesn't know. Well, the when we read, when our guys read the meter, um, if they see excessive usage, they notify the <coughs> tenant and or property owner about the leak. It um, didn't happen but to me. But, yeah, I mean, if they see it and it's something that's really unusual, they try to catch it they, and they notify. I mean, but, um, I mean, otherwise we're not going to know about the leak anyway. So. Okay, let's open up the floor for comments. Sam, you've been patient. Well, come, you need to come up. Some well, Chris, Chris will answer. Okay, I don't come up. Three <laughs> 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 I got at least four more after. Well, why don't you why don't you list the questions okay. and then two primary questions here. Is there anything that legally prohibits either the village or a landlord from billing utilities in advance as opposed to in arrears? Well, well I, I interpret that question to mean can a landlord uh, require or the a deposit up front? Well, the village does require a deposit. Bill it. Okay. Bill it, not a deposit. I don't, but how can you bill well, that? What I'm saying years. is, can I, years years years. can I look at my can I look at my history on a house right. and mm -hmm. say this house averages $150 a month? Here's when you, when you sign a lease to move in, I want to collect that first month's utilities, and when the bill comes in from the village, I'll adjust it. I think if it's reconciled at the end, I would think that that practice would be acceptable, but I don't know the you, Okay, next, next question, and then you maybe you can prepare them for this group um, before the next meeting. Next question is, that imposes a fairly heavy administrative burden on landlords. Is there any legal prohibition to a markup on the utility bills? I, I, one, I, I don't know the answer to that. And also in the context of my role, schools are uncomfortable giving legal advice to anybody. What I would so give it to them. You're their well, employee. Well, <laughs> well, but you're asking on the, on the context of a landlord. Yes. Uh, I'm giving advice on behalf of Ms. Ballard. I want to go back to your original question. But the first question is why you're saying I want to uh, a, a, a utility bill a month in advance. I want to collect that, it in advance. From my, from 
back when I was a renter, I remember that the, the landlords would ask for it a month in advance when I rented. Right. Was that called a deposit or an advance payment? Yeah, I, I don't, to me, it's a distinction without a difference. It's the deposit that the landlord wants as part of the contractual relationship to, to rent the property. Okay. Um, now, what, what was the second question again? I'm sorry. Is there any legal prohibition on applying a markup to the utility bill that we then charge the tenant? I can't answer that question. I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting dynamic because I know the first place that, that I rented after I graduated from college had utilities included. Could they have marked it up? I don't know. I never saw a bill. Right. There was a reasonable rate. That I think was that's charged. a little different issue, but no, I, it may be, maybe not. It depends on how the landlord wants to manage that relationship and how you want to define it. <laughs> okay. The next question uh, is actually from Melissa. Do we, when a person comes in to sign up for utilities currently, they actually sign a contract, I assume. Mm -hmm. Can I get a copy of that contract? It's, it, it's actually, Sam, very similar to the sample one, the new one that's in the, um, in the packet, packet right. um, the draft one. There is a disclaimer on it about collecting the, the uh, deposit, correct, Melissa? It basically says any old debt is transferred to the new account. So right. if, if somebody left us with a bill of like $150 when they come in to sign up, they're saying that <coughs> that amount will be transferred onto that account. And we do have a back form where um, a landlord can come in and sign surety and then we don't collect the deposit. Right. Okay, I'll be in to pick up a copy tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And the next question is, I assume, and I have not looked in detail in the packets that were available on mm -hmm. the way in, but I assume there is a contract under the new policy which will be, which the landlord will be required to sign. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like a copy of that one also. It, it's, yeah, it's just a draft right now, but the, it is in the packet, so okay. there should be some. Those are my, okay. oh, one last question. Um, a quick glance at the packets on the way in shows that there is no differentiation between residential and commercial accounts under this proposed ordinance. Is that correct? That's correct. Then I'll address that further in my three minute time. Okay. Um, Joe? Well, we just shot the affordable housing out of Yellow Springs, didn't we? <laughs> There's going to be no more. One question I'd like to ask, first of all. Is it legal for me, young man, <laughs> to go into my tenant's house and turn off their electric water sewer and track of all the trash not? Can I just go in there arbitrarily because the village says they're behind, and I can go in a family with a baby in there, sprocket in a chair, and I turn everything off. Am I legal, or am I going to be sued? If uh, what I'll say is, in a general sense, and again, I'm not giving anybody any specific. No, I understand that. It's just general. That, that, that a landlord presumably would have a contract, a lease, and if there are violations of that lease, there's a there's a process by which the landlord has to go through. Right. What you're talking about is can may a landlord engage in self-help? And the answer to that question is likely if you do it, you do so at your own risk because you have a mechanism that's an eviction. And you think of a tenant as a consumer, and consumers have certain protections under the law. So the village would not have the little wrench that turns everything off or whoever does the electric. We would have our own? No, no, no. no. You, you, again, I... I I hate, to be, I hate to be too lawyerly in this, but, but again, I, I, I can't give specific legal advice, but I can say generally that a, there's a contract, there has to be an eviction process. The, if landlords were responsible for the bill, there would be a mechanism in place that would allow the village to turn off those utilities in the event of a delinquency without a landlord necessarily having to go to court. Okay. Okay. And Xenia and Xenia has that model. I mean, the fact is, is that if you look at, I don't know what the numbers were, what we have 77% or only 80% of the, the municipalities in Ohio that do this, right. they have that process. We don't have to go and reinvent the wheel of council determines this is the path they want to right. take. And through that, um, 
you know, I, re I read the case law that comes out every week. I can't remember seeing a case that involves a landlord dispute with the municipality over the utility issue. I think in those communities, they figured out a way to make it work, and the landlords have figured out a way to do their business. And then it's up to the community to, to determine whether or not they want to do it or not. And so the services to the utilities, and, and, and are we really talking about electric, water, sewer, or are we just talking about water and sewer? We're, ta never we're talking about all of the services, electric, water, sewer, and garbage. They're all in one bill. All because it says utilities in these papers, and if it says that, it's Correct. all covered. Yes, ma'am. So it means everything. Yes. 735.29 in the Ohio Revised Code includes it electric in that, as well as water and sewer. Okay. Right. And, and my suggestion to answer your question, your first question a little bit more thoroughly, is every county has a Fair Housing Authority office, which in our case is, is in Xenia. And I would suggest you call them and ask them your question about you going in yourself and, and turning them off and see what they say. They know all of that stuff forwards and backwards, and they would probably be able to give you a much more definitive answer. Okay. Thanks, Thank Joe. Dean? <clears throat> Go, Betty. I asked this question the last time I was here. Are you going to notify the landlord? I still say a lot of this could be eliminated if you notify the landlord yes. when you notify the tenant. Yes, ma'am. That's what I said, that we would give you. You will definitely do that. We will give you the option of either an email notification or a notification through the mail at the same time that that delinquent letter is sent to your tenant. Right. Yes, I mean, I got a tenant right now that skipped down on me. Yes, ma'am. She will not answer her calls, yes. my calls, yes. and she owes me rent. Yes, ma'am. A whole month's rent. She probably, so she the village isn't her. the only one losing. Yeah. No, she's not going to call me back because she owes me money. Right. She probably owes us money, too. <laughs> That's probably very so. true. But yeah, that is part of the new procedure is that you would have the option of choosing either email notification or mail through the postal service and you would get it at the same time the tenant would get that bill that says delinquent. That you're going, when will we get it now? When they it, are, when we're going to turn it off or? No, it's when the next bill goes out, which is around the first of the month after they miss a payment. Okay. All right. Correct, Melissa? Well, I think, well. They, they miss the 15th, the next bill goes out around the first to be in the houses around the first. Well. My, we had talked about this and right. that could be that could be oh. 500 letters right that right we have to send out I was it was my intention of doing it when the disconnect went out oh I, I, I don't think that's yeah. that's not we that's not that. enough yeah. I thought we talked about uh, sorry I thought we talked about doing it once the payment arrangements were through <clears throat> So. I had said before, if you didn't have the staff to do it, it's right. still worth hiring somebody because well, landlords need to know. Right. Well, one of the things that we're going to present tonight is um, our part-time person in, in that office is actually retiring, and Melissa is going to present to make it a full-time position. Okay. All right. Okay. And Melissa, I'm sorry, did you also say that a landlord can call now anytime? Mm -hmm and get that information or come by the window. Right. right. I think that there had been a, an understanding for a long time that this was private information, but it's not. Dean. Hi, Gino Pallotta. All right, I've got, Melissa helped me out tremendously. We went through br brass tacks of numbers. You know, we, the motion's all gonna get revved up, da, 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 da. Let's go with the numbers. The numbers speak for themselves. $4.3 million, which you, we, we bill out every year. Huge, okay? What we're talking about. So we're all clear what we're all talking about here. For unpaid utilities, you're talking about 15,000 on the average from 2010 through 2014, $15,981. That's, three point, that's 0.37 tenths of a percent of the $4.3 million. So we're all getting worked up about this, but it's a very, it's a small amount. I know what you said too, that we're looking at the little amounts, we wanna pay attention to the little amounts because it all adds up to the big picture. Off of that, off of that total, when we, I asked her to break it down one more step to give me the renters and give me the homeowners that aren't paying. Off of that, the renters that we looked at, off the renters, you're looking at $14,640. Again, that's an average for the, la the past five years. That's 0.3 tenths of a percent. So we're talking small, 
This is a small potato thing that we're looking at, and we're really getting worked up about it, but we got to look at the little things of it and see where you're getting your bang for your buck. And that's where we're coming in at. It's like, are you getting the bang for your buck going after this? Going after it the way that, we, that you're talking about setting policies. Going through the policy setup and working through that. I get it. I understand that you're trying to work through a policy. However, to get to the crux of what I'm going to go at, there's two, there's two places I'm lo looking at. Property taxes. And we know property taxes, when we're looking at numbers of unpaid property taxes, is huge. It's six figures. There's a lot of money there. I know the county works it out. What you gave me, the, the county is going to send it back. It'll come through. It trickles in. As you said, it came through already the first quarter. But it's a lot of money. That's a big area of where, if we're looking for found money, that's obviously a big area to go after. Um, solutions and problems. I think what we mentioned before was carrot and stick a little bit. But what, what I'm looking at is the affordability issue. And that's where we're going to come into a little bit of trouble is that when you guys are doing the collections, if we're going, if we're going to increase on the collections and just be more aggressive on the shutoffs, it goes with the behavior. If we're leaning on the shutoffs, then you're going to be leaning on getting the money back. If you're if you're strong, if you're strict on the shutoffs, you're going to lower the debt. You're going to get payments. So you're already doing a great job. I mean, we're looking at 0.3 tenths of a percent. So obviously, the collection it's working. I mean, there's still a mound out there, but it's working, and it's working well. I mean, you got to be commended. I mean, a lost business, any business that's at three tenths of a percent is doing phenomenal. I mean, I can't run my business that way. I'm not at three tenths. I mean, you know, we're two, three, four, five percent of lost. That's just life. That's just business. So you're doing a great job. What we're looking at, Oops. may I please continue? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All I'm looking at, or the action I was looking at, is be more aggressive, and I think you guys have already been aggressive on collections in-house. What you can't collect out of that $14,000, turn it over to collections. You know what? That's their job to be aggressive. That's their job to be a pain in the butt. That's what they're supposed to do, and they're supposed to be aggravating. They're supposed to be poking you and make you pay. If you get half of it, it's half. It's better than nothing. I mean, as, as, as a final option. And then lastly, you know, you can increase the, before we head down the policy, of what you guys are going towards. You know, the other the other thing is that you increase your deposits. You know, we already said we can't do sliding scale, so that's that's been answered. But the bottom line is affordability, and that's a side that I'm afraid of is that there's gonna be three things that are going to happen. You know, we have already said it that there's gonna be affordability issue that security deposits are going to get larger. There's going to automatically be another security deposit on utilities, which again, a landlord's not going to expose himself. They're going to want a little more coverage and protection. And then they're going to raise the rent and then they're going to look for a stricter credit uh, app. So they're not going to rent to a group of people that's going to be questionable. You know, they're not going to expose themselves. So those are the things when you're looking at affordability, you don't want to outprice yourself and then all of a sudden we're not going to be an affordable community. What we're looking for in the mix that we're going to, that we're trying to get you're automatically going to start eliminating that going forward. Not going what we've got, but going forward, you're going to lose that mix. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Dean. Yes. <clears throat> Michael Kreitzer. Uh, a couple of things. You don't check the utility meters every month. You do them once a quarter. Water. Water. Yeah. So, with regard to that, you can have a leak that is going to be the, the landlord's responsibility. The tenant is going to be in that property. We're going to look for the village to do more aggressive meter reading on that if the bills are going to be in our name and not the tenants. The, the other side of the coin is these tenants are going to be incurring late charges and penalties, yet at the end of the day, we're going to be responsible. Is the village going to be willing to waive the penalties and the and the late charges when the landlord is responsible for those bills I, I just ask that as a as, as, as a question if at the end of the day we're not choosing to collect the bills pay them in advance of collecting them from our tenants are we going to be responsible for that and, and to the other point that the deal made earlier is you know you, if you you know how much the utilities average at a property because you do estimated billing today. If you were to simply increase your deposits to two months worth of utility usage at each one of the properties, using your 45-day cutoff, you would have money to pay that bill. 
without having to add people to the utility department, without having to send out additional bills and notices to all the landlords, you would ask for, you would have that money on deposit when you close out those accounts. I can assure you that as a landlord, I will ask for at least, if not more than two months worth of utility usage in order to rent to someone, which will drive right home to the, to the point of, of affordability. Increase in security deposits, increase in utility deposits, and you're going to find a gentrification of the people that are able to afford to rent in this town. Thank you. Thanks. Ellen? <coughs> Excuse me. Ellen Hoover. Um, I just have three questions, and they can be part of my three minutes. <laughs> but Chris uh, mentioned he can talk about passing landlord-friendly bill procedures, and I'd kind of like to hear what those are. Uh, my second question is, what about land contracts? Uh, you're selling a property under land contract to someone who is managing that apartment building of, in our case, four units. Um, but our name's on the deed because it's year two or three of the land contract. So what are you going to do? How's that going to work? And uh, I would really like to know why on earth you let a utility bill get to $1,200. I learned a long time ago it is terribly unkind to let people build their debt to the point that they have to skip out or in one case I know of, dip into retirement to pay huge bills. It's just a horrible thing to do and I swore I would never do it to anybody again. And I get that debt collection going pretty quick early in the process rather than let somebody get a bill up to, why? Why did you do that? Let it get to 1,200. I don't get it. But those are the three questions. Okay. Any other comments, Sam? No, actually, I saw Bob. Like, let's let people that haven't spoken, Bob, and then um, Mr. Cannon. Bob Baldwin. Uh, I won't say this is a bad idea or a terrible idea. I will say it's not a very good idea. The first question I have is the magnitude of the problem. On page three of meeting two weeks ago, it indicates the average over the last 10 years, a $1,100 a month or 11,000 a year you have to write off. I want to know what percentage of that is to owner occupied properties versus landlord rented properties. I think that's important to determine the magnitude of the property. The second thing is, we all know it's a tight housing market. I get 10, 12 calls every day. There are more people want to move to this vital, eclectic, electric town than there is housing. We all know that. And I do know, regardless of how this works out, if landlords are responsible, they are going to increase their deposits. They are going to get a credit application. They are going to really ask a lot of questions. And the end result is some of the diversity we always enjoy, we embrace. You're going to lose some of that diversity to the lower economic spectrum of our citizens. Now, that should not be a goal, but that is going to happen. Uh, thirdly, I would say as a villager lifetime, even 1100 a month is, is a drain. But I say let's tighten up the policy because it is terribly loose, mm -hmm. really loose, and give this thing a six-month waiting period to see if it works. And if it doesn't, then as a landlord, and I just sent you folks $2,583.41 for electric bills, and I brought my bills, and I, and I got 30 seconds for this, but if at the end of six months it hasn't improved, then as a landlord, and I want to say, well, if you've got the deposits at a certain percentage of the rent, if he's paying $1,300 a month for his house, 
then he ought to pay that same percentage of 1300 He's certainly going to use more utilities. And it's an easy policy. You're looking at the lease. You know what the rent is. So tailor your deposit to the monthly rent. That's number one. Number two, tighten up the distance. I have four mortgages with U.S. Bank, three mortgages with West Banco, and one mortgage with the estate of W.W. Deaton. And they all say... It's due on the 1st. If it's not paid by the 15th, it's going to be a 5% penalty. My property tax is down to Xenia twice, twice a year. If it's not paid on that date, it is a 10% penalty. And I found out the hard way, if I'm one day late, it's 10%. I said, well, hell, they're charging me already. I won't pay second <laughs> half until I... And, and they say, we won't accept second half until you pay the first half. So anyway, so... They got you. But now, one more thing. I've got these utility bills. Here we go. 716 Eugene Avenue. The total bill is 234 bucks. Service date, January 8th to January 29th. Bill date, 2-23. I got it. The village always gets the bills out on the 1st or the 2nd. And they want it paid by the 15th. They want it paid by the 15th. On a service date, 08, I mean, 18 to 129, and then you're saying, we're going to give you, it's due on that there, we're going to give you another 30 days and another seven? Get real. You cannot be in the service business and the collection business. You can't, you can't wear both hats. Okay. And you don't have to. You've just got to sit down, you've got to get a committee with two landlords, two council people, and an administrator that can break a tie and come up with a policy that makes sense. Try this policy. If it doesn't work, come back to the landlord and say, hey guys, you're going to have to be part of the solution. But asking them to be now with this loosey-goosey policy, it's not fair, and you are, if it, if it doesn't work and we end up having to do it, you are going to lose the diversity and the contribution and part of the excitement of Yell Springs. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Mr. Cannon. Well, in connection with the schedule for billing, we could, it often happens that the meter is read maybe the seventh of the month, but then the bill only comes out the first of the next month. There's three weeks right there when water's leaking, maybe, before the bill even comes out. And then we start the schedule we heard about. It would be much better if the village could bill promptly after reading a meter. Uh, meters sometimes get read very wrong. We recently had, a, for a little apartment that cost about $20 a month, we had a $2,000 bill. Well, that was because the meter was read wrong. I don't know how many of these bills you're getting are because of bad re meter readings, but it's also an issue. Um, and making landlords responsible, you're making landlords be like the parents of the tenants. That's where one has out there being responsible for somebody else's bill. The dependent children, the parents are responsible. It's not good to put that into a landlord-tenant relationship. And even if other villages do it, Yellow Springs is different. You talk to people from other villages and they say, yes, Yellow Springs is different. Well, let's not do it here. Thank you. And I oh, just sorry. take one more second to emphasize again, you're talking about less than half of a percent of the utility. It's not worth making so much discomfort in this village just for that. You can raise the rents, the um, bills by half of a percent, and as I mentioned in the Yellow Springs News, we'd pay an extra 75 cents maybe on our utility bill. That's not that much, but if you stick it all on one landlord, you're causing all this chaos and havoc. Thank you. Sam? I'm ready for my three minutes. <laughs> I don't know the origin of the uh, village um, utility service. Um, the idea pre-existed in my time in Yellow Springs and that's been over 50 years. But my understanding is that 
when the village utility service was initiated, the idea was we'll buy it from DPNL wholesale, we'll sell it to our residents retail at the same rate DPNL charges, and we'll put money in the village coffers. And my impression also is that it worked for a number of years just that way. The last few decades, I think it has not worked that way. And I don't know whether this service is profitable for you or not, whether it adds to village coffers or is run at a loss. But let me suggest that if you are operating at a profit, and if your uncollectible account rate is 0 0.37, you don't need to make any changes at all. And if you really want to go after that 0 0.37%, that what you need to do is start billing in advance instead of arrears on all new accounts and your problem goes away in about three years. That's my first comment. Second comment is we really need, no matter what else happens, to differentiate between residential and commercial accounts. Now my understanding is that when Vernet Laboratories was operating the Dayton plant, that they consumed about 27%, 25% of all of the electric in Yellow Springs. That's a big account. We have a tenant who's just finished rewiring three of our warehouses for 480 volts, 400 amps on each leg. That's beginning to smell like a very, very big account. And I don't think it's right to hold people personally liable for accounts that might run 12 and $15,000 a month. And I don't know where to go with that. I don't think it's right. Um, we also have two tenants who use commercial quantities of water. One produces beer, one produces distilled spirits. As they grow, those are going to be very, very large water accounts. Are you going to hold me liable for them? You know, you're talking about holding a person, an individual, liable for commercial quantities of electric and water and sewer. And I don't believe that's right. I think it fails on a moral scale. Paul? Paul Abendroth. There was one more letter I hand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 There was one more letter hand delivered this evening to my wife, Susan. And rather than read it in the three minutes allowed to me, I ask you to read it and consider it in your deliberations. There's another class of, custom, of landlords that I would like to hear how you would process. Green Met Housing, Home Inc, Section 8 Houses. Can you address those three? Who's, how do you collect for those three types of landlords? Thank you. Green Met has actually been incredibly supportive. They um, <clears throat> caught wind of the discussion um, a few weeks ago, and they had uh, called Jerry down in the office and said, hey, when's this happening? And she said, well, it's still in the discussion stages. And she said, you guys are the only ones that don't hold us responsible. We're just trying to figure out when it's going to happen. So I, I do know that at least Green Met, we have been in communication with them, and they did tell us that we're the only ones that don't hold them responsible. And they said, you guys really should make the change. So that was said um, to us by Green Met. The other two, um, I haven't had conversations with. Um, maybe my staff downstairs has, and I can ask them about that. But they did bring up Green Met to me. But but Green Met owns the, their their housing. The other two types of housing are owned by um, are owned by the property owners, whether it's Section Eight or not. It's still owned by a property no, owner. No, but Home Inc. Home. Tenant pays to utilities. Now Lawson Place is paid by Green Met. I used to work there. The individual <laughs> units, the tenants are paying the utilities. For Green Met houses. Yes. Yes. That's right. True. But they are. I know they are. But she's saying that Green Met, it's standard practice in Green County, except for Yellow Springs, that 
the landlords are responsible for utilities and in that regard green met everywhere else in green county is responsible for the utilities yeah, but I don't think that's going to pay on the individual houses. Yes. Yes. They will. Yes. They'll pay the utility. Yes. Mm -hmm. You've heard that you've got a sign thing from them. They've not. Well, we don't have a sign no. document, but there was a conversation with one of our utility billing clerks wondering when it was going to go into effect. I don't believe that. I, and I don't. Balance. And don't get me wrong. I'm not calling you a liar. Right. But I don't know how they can justify spending federal yes. funds to do that. I really question that it's because it's true. Pardon? Section 8 on Quarter Street. Where it's so, we, we will get the answer to the question. Right. We'll, we'll find out. We'll do the research. The reason I asked is your process would add to the tax. They don't pay tax. They would add, it would add to the transfer of property, and that property will never transfer. So you don't have a mechanism in this <coughs> proposed legislation to collect those overdue utility bills. Do you have a same mechanism for Home Inc. where Home Inc. owns the property? Is it, does it go on there? Do they have to pay? I can answer Section that. 8 housing, the... Section 8's individual tenant. Yes, but the, the property that. owner doesn't get to run a credit check or, or whatever. That yes, processing is done by the agency. No, we will not for section okay. Eight, it's done by we the will get the we will get the information. Marianne, would you? Home Inc. Home owners pay their own property tax. Home Inc. does not pay the property tax, so and it so would be just like eight. any other homeowner. And they own their homes; they don't rent. Ellen. <laughs> Ellen Hoover, I just have a quick question. I had three questions. Um, when could I anticipate those? I think we can be reviewed. Did, did you write them down, Ellen's? I, I wrote everybody's questions down. <laughs> I'm not sure who's. Um, and we've got them all on tape. Yes, would you? Well, I can repeat them I, if you'd I, like. One was from Chris. He mentioned about landlord friendly uh, right. procedures right. I was interested Correct. in uh, how you'd handle land contracts and why a twelve hundred dollar land, land contracts I can answer um, the pr the procedure as it as the draft is written um, is whoever's name is on the C Green County auditors website and and generally in a land contract that would stay in the, the seller's name until the contract is complete at which point it actually gets transferred to the purchaser correct yes so right. that I mean as it's written right now that's the answer to that question um, which is interesting because I have no control over the renters I don't sign the renters leases I have no review potential I mean mm -hmm. it's yeah, land contracts are an odd my property. Uh, kind yeah. of an odd duck but yeah yeah um, I'm I'm just bringing it up because I'm sure I'm not the only one. Facing. Well, and but the auditor essentially holds you legally responsible for taxes. Right, right, right. That's true. So I mean, that would be the same premise. Right. And um, if it were assessed, it, you you would be paying that. If the utility bill were assessed, oh, yeah, it would I'll be get paid all, on the I'll sale. Get, right. I certainly get all the right. responsibility. Uh, right. Thank yeah. you very and, much. <laughs> so. And um, as far as the, the bill getting to the amount that it did, I think Melissa can probably answer that question. We have a number of properties in town that are all electric heat, and it's not uncommon in the winter at all for a bill to get up. If, if, it's, a, if it's a house that has children, electronic devices, electric heat baseboard heat we have a number of properties that get large utility bills just because of the nature of baseboard heat i have baseboard heat in my house it's and expensive. my bill is four times what it is in the winter than it is in the summer mm -hmm. okay thank you that does answer that yeah. and then chris i i mean clearly we're we don't have legislation tonight we're still in discussion i expect there's a lot of questions that will be answered mm -hmm. whether it will be on the very next agenda we'll decide at the end of this meeting but mm -hmm. um we're still in process and, and the questions right. will be answered. Chrissy, and then I, I really, after this, we, we need Chrissy to. Chrissy, I just have two, I just wanted to ask two questions. Was I correct in that when you said that the survey that you had of all the other um, areas that charge the landlords for the utilities, 
that none of them have the electric included in that? that that's just not, water and sewer? No, that, that's not no? true. Some of them also have electric. Because the electric is usually the big giant part of your bill. I was thinking if it's just water and sewer, you know, that's not really going to be. No, so the, it, some of them have just water and sewer. Some of them have garbage also. Some of them have electric also. I mean, it's kind of a okay. mixture. I was just kind of wondering if it was comparing apples to oranges. Mm -hmm. um, also, the other thing that I was questioning, and somebody else brought it up, why not just charge, like, too much a a average bill as a deposit, and then that way you're always you're, you're covered, and this whole the whole problem goes because away. an average bill is based on the property and the habits of the person living there, and we can't charge a sliding scale. I mean, essentially, that is the same as a sliding scale. Okay. So, excellent. Just one. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. I would um, like to just address one thing. If okay. I could. Um, you know, a couple of a couple of folks have said, um, you know, this is such a small percent, and you're absolutely right, this is a very small percent. But we are making small changes. We made a small change in um, the sewer <coughs> readiness for service charge. That was a small change that will result in some revenues. We made a small change when council gave staff a 1% increase and decided to hold off on anything else because of the budget. We made a small change when I asked my staff to cut 3% out of their budgets before they even submitted them this year. And all of these things by themselves are small. I absolutely agree with that. But all of these small changes taken together at the end of the day, hopefully, if we keep working, because there are other things that we'd like to discuss, um, at the end of the day, we hope that these will come together and, and help make a more sustainable, healthier budget. So when you say it's a very small percentage, I absolutely agree with that. But everything we're trying to do is a small change that will eventually add up to a larger amount of money. Karen, I have one other quick question, a quick comment, if I may. 30 yeah. seconds, Sam. Yeah. I think I overlooked it in my notes, but it was my intention to add that if the electric utility is not producing a profit, you ought to sell it. Whole thing. Actually, the electric utility is the most profitable of all the enterprise funds. So if you're making a profit and writing off 0.37%, well, it also that that percentage also includes the water and sewer. Business usually writes off two, three, four, five. This is a this is, this is a policy discussion that um, I I think we still have information. I, I still feel like I need more information. Chris, I mean, you, you took notes. Um, Patty took notes. We've got the tape. I know that there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered, so I'm hoping that for the next meeting um, we can bring back some of the questions. I know something I would like to see is it, what, kind of po what kind of policy or procedure changes can we make short of that, that could tighten things up? short of making the property owners responsible. The, this idea that somebody is able to, the, the trouble I have is if there's a property that has a thousand dollar utility bill on it, somebody leaves, it's still sitting there, and a new tenant comes in. Is there a way to, to deal with that? You know, I, I know that, that that was a story I saw in the, on, on, um, in the Dayton Daily News that somebody bought a house, Mm -hmm. They couldn't get their service hooked up because the there was a utility. There was still a utility delinquency. Now that's a situation where if it would have been taken care of, if it would have been assessed to the property at the sale of the property, it would have been taken care of. That's correct. Um, and the only and I believe that that is the only way to. It, take care of the situation that you're talking about. Okay. Is that it be assessed to the property so that when the property is sold, it, that is collected from the seller. Um, and Can I make one comment? The title agency should have found the transaction. Right, they, right, they should have. That's correct, yeah. but they didn't. Uh, uh, one thing that I think we as council have to look at is uh, do we want, are we looking for a zero-sum delinquents? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm looking looking at the uh, delinquent report that um, Melissa prepared from 2010 to 2014. And, and this report is broken out by renters and homeowners. So I, as a council person, have, have to kind of look at it and say, you know, uh, 
and I'll just give you the numbers for 14, which you should have. It was $406 for homeowners, total uncollected. It was 13,119.9 for renter totals uncollected. Okay? So, then I have to look at, as a homeowner, do I want to subsidize the renters? So all of us have really two, these two things that we have to look at. As most of us are homeowners, plus we're, we're thinking in, in, out into the future. And is a zero sum really? Uh, what business has a zero bad debt? Yeah, that, yeah. So, you know. Uh, but, but then again, I still have to look at the rent and renter side of the picture, and I think Karen kind of alluded to that, is what can we do, and I think Sam also said it, is there an interim step, and if that interim step doesn't work, then we know where we're going, whether we like it or not. So. I Brian, still Marianne, landlords are notified. I'm, um, Brian and Marianne comments. Oh, sorry. Why are you? <laughs> Brian, <laughs> um, well, I agree with Jerry that we need to make the decision that's best for the entire village, and uh, I have heard a lot of good arguments on both sides. Um, I guess the second thing is, and it kind of relates to this issue of affordability, I think we have to remember that there are two sides to that coin as well. So one of the things that I think is going to be a challenge for all of us is, is you know, sort of how does this all balance out? Um, and uh, I'm still listening. Okay, so now I, I hate my cookie. Uh, um, I would be interested in finding out some information from other communities that have uh, switched in the last decade. Um, um, did, actually, it, did it impact um, the rent? Which I, is, I actually emailed five that have done it in the last five years, and only one of them responded uh, to my request, my email, because that was one of the questions I, I asked was, did it have any unintended consequences, such as increasing rents and that type of thing? Um, Jason Wood from the city of Cleveland called. Um, they've not seen anything like that. He actually um, used to sit on AMP's board as well. And um, you know, he was the only one. We, um, Ruth Ann spent quite a lengthy time on the phone with him gathering information. And um, they have not had any unintended consequences such as that. So, so that, that's one. And I'd be even willing to make some calls to some communities to if we could find some communities that well, seem well, similar. Well, please, right? yeah. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. also um, yeah. Melissa, you said that if, um, you implied that about one third of the, um, the customers are paying late every month. Is that really the okay? case? Well, it's, we have about 200 on disconnect every month. So that's just the ones that are on disconnect. The ones that are in arrears 30 days, I would have to run some reports to get a solid number. But we do have a number of people that are habitually on, you know. That are running our, late. Yes, are running late. And then we do send out approximately 200 disconnect letters a month. So we have, what, 1,700? <coughs> Um, I think we send out 2,300. We have 2,300 utility customers, but the, the number of ones that are 30 days past due, I'll have to do some research to get a oh, solid number on that. 23, okay. Um, also, uh, I, 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 the idea of getting some landlords, maybe even some tenants together to, I know staff is not, not appreciative of this idea, but I could, uh, I could support doing something like that um, also phasing in some uh, changes into our policy mm -hmm. to see whether that would create uh, better payment, quicker payment. So those, and I, I wrote down a bunch of questions that I will write up for staff and council as well. And I think another piece of this is, is um, if AMP, AMP has the, or Efficiency Smart 
program ha does have some <coughs> residential, does have some things for residential. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a possibility that, you know, I, I like to see this as a partnership. I mean, you know, you guys don't want us refusing utilities for somebody that you've just rented to and it seems to me that I assume when people rent property that you let them know what their total monthly requirement is going to be. I mean, you can check the bills and so you know about what their in what their monthly bill is. So I would hope that when landlords are giving leases to tenants that they're insured that they can actually pay that utility bill in addition to their rent bill. Um, I mean, because it doesn't, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense to rent a, a property to somebody if they can't pay everything. You're making, we're making the generalization that this is a major problem. You know, this is a small amount of problem. There's a problem, but we can't make the assumption that everybody's bad here because it's not the case. I mean, you're small at, at 0 0.3, you know, 0.4 percent. It's a small problem that we can address with those certain people. Well, what I was, what I was, I would like to see if there was a way for us to, to roll some, you know, looking at, at doing some improvements, some, some improvements to properties with through the AMP program, Efficiency Smart right. Program, to perhaps get rebates back to property owners mm -hmm. to make energy efficiency improvements make financial sense. So I'm not going to, we. I can't continue to have, I'm. But if you have 200 people that are on disconnect, kind of rolling every month, if, to Betty's point, if you let the landlords know that, I will tell you, if I had a tenant with that, it would be an event that defaults on the lease, and I would evict them. And you would you would eliminate some of these people that are on that 200 disconnects every month. Just let us know who they are. Okay, we're we're going to staff has. Um, I'm not going to take any more comments. This has gone way way too long. Um, sure. On the issue of the eviction, the potential problem would be if under the lease, the land the tenant is not responsible for. Utilities, apartment, for it. It's not clear, depending on how the lease is written, that it would automatically be or a or bill. It's not going to be rewritten. Well, it's not going to be rewritten. I mean, I mean, everybody's got their own lease for it. Right. But that's not the Mine's story. clear. So, <laughs> Council, do we want to bring this back to the next meeting with lots of questions answered? Yeah. More questions answered? Okay. Right. And uh, Melissa, Patty, the rest of staff, thank you for continuing to work on this. I know how much work it's been. Karen, you have someone. Um, I'll take one more short question. I just wanted to know, Sharon writes, why we can use an estimate to inform a tenant how much they'll owe, but we can't use the same estimate to determine how, to Bob's point, how could um, pay forward because that was made or it made the reference that that was a sliding scale and it's the same number it's it's it the number will vary by property and tenant yes. and tenants yes, uh, it will. It, and so I'm giving my tenant history right and that same historical number can be used to look ahead I agree. I agree that the number can be used to look ahead. The problem is that what you're allowed to do as a private landlord and what we're allowed to do as a government is quite a bit different. And for us, using a this number for this property and this number for this property and this number for this property would amount to a sliding scale because it's different for every property, and we have to treat everyone the same. Chris, am I? But our tenants are different also. I, I agree. I, want, I, I, I would tenants. like to look at that issue. Let, let's. It, 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 it's a best practice, but there could be some exceptions. I know that the, the DPNL and actually will look at, at certain right. criteria. On the commercial side, for sure, they look at right. it. Again, I, again I they're private general, companies. We'll look into that for the yeah. next meeting. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, next item on the agenda is the council retreat agenda. The council retreat is March 31st. Um, I didn't really change much. Um, we did change the location to Rockford Chapel. Um, and 
um, we also did decide that um, since the there's a I'll just wait a second. Yeah. Um, since there's um, in, in Patty's report, you'll notice that we have our um, students coming from um, Southeast Asia. So they'll be working on social media. So it seems silly to put it on the agenda. So um, we're going to do a report on the charter review okay. in place of that. Um, I had a question. Sure. So uh, taking out that uh, the social media policy, there were five bullet points. And looking at the agenda, uh, I'm not clear where we would be talking about the second one, which is ensuring documents presented. Agenda planning and management. Okay. Cool. <coughs> I tried to be brief in my... Okay. <laughs> and we know social media is dropped off. Right, yeah. And I and those were actually just those were just suggestions that I received and not necessarily intended to be reflected completely in the agenda. So is everybody okay with this? Yeah. Is everybody ready for a fun day? Mm -hmm. Okay, new business. Um, another agenda for the joint meeting with the township trustees. Chris and I, Chris Mutcher, the president of the township trustees, and I met the other day and uh, just kind of drafted out a. a an agenda. Chris has seen this and he thought it was good. He was going to present it to his uh, board tonight, um, his trustees. So, is anything that anybody wants to change or comment on about that? Looks good. Okay. Yep. Um, now we're on to our managers and assistant managers report. We'll start with Patty. Sorry, I was looking at an email from Sharon Boykin. Um, the uh, public meeting for the water softening options is scheduled for this uh, Wednesday, March 18th, 7 to 9 in rooms A and B. We did move it down there because we thought we might have um, a few too many people to get in this room. Um, so anyone who is interested in this discussion should attend this meeting because it is possible this will be the only meeting on softening. Um, if you cannot attend and you would like the information, we can make the information on the presentation available and you can email comments to either myself or Judy at our village email addresses. Um, the information in your packets on funding for the water plant, if everyone would please pull up that separate page that I submitted. Um, and essentially it goes through the various funding uh, sources and the fact that we are not eligible for some of them for various reasons. Um, <coughs> we do have three possibilities, the OEPA, the, o the Ohio EPA, the Ohio Water Development Authority, and the Ohio Public Works Commission. Um, long story short, I have talked to uh, the Ohio Public Works Commission, the local district, uh, which is 11. Um, they seem, seem to think it is possible that we could get some grant funding and um, also some loan funding, which is at 0% for 30 years. OPWC is always at 0% for 30 years or the life of the infrastructure. Um, the problem with waiting for OPWC is twofold. Number one, it's competitive funding, so there is no actual assurance that we will get it. Um, and waiting for it, the money would not become available until July 1 of next year, <coughs> which is the same day that the EPA funding becomes available. So <clears throat> my recommendation to Council is that we hold off, we apply for OPWC funding this year, uh, perhaps a $300,000 grant and a $1 million loan. Um, if we were able to secure that funding over the course of the 30 years, it would save us $350,000. Um, and interest. Then whatever is not made up um, out of that um, we could get through either the OEPA at 1.3% interest or the OWDA at 1.6% interest the, at the current market rates. So that is my recommendation to Council. It will delay the construction of the plant. We can do everything up to breaking ground and then you can break ground July 1 of next year. Um, so we could still go through the entire process we could get up to letting the contract, but we cannot break ground until July 1. If council does not wish to delay um, until then, we do have the option of doing a complete loan um, funding through the OWDA at 1.6%. So 
so i guess my question to council is do you want to hold off and apply for opwc um and o o e p a or would you like to move forward with o w d a once we get the the price to build the plant the <coughs> and you do not have to make this decision today the, the, the only question i have for you is that if we started the process for the loan through owda mm -hmm. that disqualifies us for no the other it does not. no so, no uh, but it'll take it you'll be able to you'll be able to get the owda loan through um in plenty of time to match it with the the grant funding no no, no, the well, lack I, was, of it. no I was saying that <clears throat> if we got the full amount through the uh, owda mm -hmm. and we started the project mm -hmm. okay then you can't then we cannot can, we can't then go out and apply for try that, to, that's yeah. correct you can't yeah. break so, ground right so and we're we're you know like i say you don't need an answer today but right <laughs> Okay. And and what about just what about going forward with the water plant, but using these this this structure for the loop complete or for the bottleneck? Using these fund funding sources for the bottleneck. You you can do that as well. Um, although you'd save more money if you did it with the water plant, um, but you can do the, that as well. Um, any of these sources would be at, would work for either any of the three water projects that we have. Um, the problem is we've already started the loop completion. In fact, we're going to sign the contract on that, um, I think, on the 25th. So that's the one that we need the funding for now. The other two. But we already had, and we already have money on that. We already have OPWC money on the. You, we have 400000 but we still have to put another 400000 <laughs> in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that is where I wanted to ask if you wanted me to go ahead and get the OWDA loan for that project by itself um, so that we did not have to take that money out of the general fund. We could leave that 405000 that was appropriated in the general fund mm -hmm. and just use this OWDA loan. And what's the rate? It, the rate is 1.6%, and Melissa did a quick calculation. Um, the 10 percent that we passed tonight, six percent of it makes the budget fl or the fund flush, and I think another two percent or two and a half percent of that 10 percent would pay that loan payment. And what's the what's the term? 30 years. 30 years, and it was gonna it was gonna be like an extra 22 or 23 thousand dollars a year. Right. So the 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 rate that we the <coughs> increase that we passed tonight would make it flush, make the water fund break even for the year it would pay for the loop completion project um, and it would still put a little bit back into yeah a very small amount back into the water fund and that would enable us to leave the four hundred five thousand dollars in the general fund instead of taking it out of there Thank you. So, so so you are asking us to make a decision on the Yes, because I'll have to you have to get legislation and fill out an application and, yeah. and we I, can, yeah, I, I I think you know that one one point one and a half percent interest is pretty darn good. Uh -huh. It's it, it's actually right now it's uh, three point two percent, but because the village is a pr previous customer of mm -hmm. OWDA, you get it at fifty percent market rate. Okay. I mean, I I to keep that money in the general fund, I think would be important so it's so okay. I would I, I would definitely be supportive of that yeah. one okay right. I will move forward with that and then if council wants to think about the other uh, funding scenarios and we can come back um, I just have to that um, application for OPWC would be due in mid-July okay. could you maybe with this other one is is and maybe we can address this a little bit on on at the workshop on Wednesday night it, will Sam have a um, a timeline for the project as it is now yes we have one. so so why don't we kind we of do one. a comparison just on a timeline okay. of if we if we go forward now or if we wait for this it'll delay it by about seven months I looked because I looked it up okay to see what he had it, that means if we actually got got yeah, um, and, and you'll know by around the first of the year if you're going to get it or not. But what you're saying, we're really talking about $300,000 because 
we'll probably we could probably get the the loan right the loan is probably not that much in question it's more the grant right well, I would say so yes but they fund us an all or nothing but yeah you, you it's a, usually easier to get grant money or loan money than grant money yes so you're Which saying is why I kept the grant amount down okay that was the suggestion I had from yep. the okay other well let's folks. yeah we'll we'll okay so, okay um, back to my report um, the ICMA International Fellows are coming from Southeast Asia for the month of May, and they're, they're not students, by the way. They're oh. actually professionals. They do what John and I do. Um, oh, wow. So, um, Did we know that? Yeah, yeah. young professionals. Oh. Mm -hmm. okay. um, finance, um, as I noted earlier, Melissa has informed me that Jerry is retiring, and she would like to um, make that position a full-time position. Um, Melissa does believe if uh, you look that there is a way to redistribute some of the um, staff salaries down there that aren't actually done the way they should. Several of us, our salaries come out of a bunch of different departments because we cover different departments. Um, Melissa, would you like to explain because you're much better at that than I am. Uh, right now, Jerry's working anywhere between 25 and 30 hours a week as it is, so the increase isn't huge. Um, it's not doubling, which kind of seems like that part-time to full-time um, based on her classification. So it'd probably be about an extra 15 hours a week at worst case scenario. Um, but currently, um, Susie Yant, who is our payables and uh, payroll person, she's only paid out of, the, uh, out of three of the utilities because nobody's paid out of solid waste, which is something I'm also going to look at too because um, a number of our staff, at least Jerry and Denise, they service solid waste. Mm -hmm. So I was going to look at distributing them in that way and having solid waste um, share part of their salaries. And then Susie services the entire village as does the village manager in my position. So we're leaving some of the utilities with her um, position and shifting that some of it to administration in other places um, because she serves the entire village as well. So. I think that with some of the shifts I can make, I can cover it. So the question that we have from council is, um, would you be agreeable to make this a full time position? Because Melissa is going to have to advertise it, um, and so she needs to know what to advertise it as. And I, I would recommend to council that we do this um, because we are going to be taking on um, more responsibilities with any change that we make mm -hmm. um, down there and they are just they're understaffed now as it is I mean it's crazy down there sometimes um, I've even offered to go down and, and help cover so um, I would recommend to council that you do this mm -hmm. I support it I support it okay. okay Judy do we need a motion of some kind or I would expect does there need to be a change in a position description change yes. So there's probably going to have to be legislation, don't you think? Part, I mean that. I, I, I felt that because the position already existed, you might be able to do it more simply. And it's just um, going to go from part time to full time. Yeah, because you're not uh, affecting the structure. I, I think that falls under the purview of the manager's operations and day-to-day -day functions. So if council supports it, I can just yeah. go ahead and. I think we should have a motion. Can somebody make a motion? Yes, I move to make the Jerry's current position a full-time position. Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, okay, the 2014 is audit is beginning this month, um, <coughs> which means we're not going to be two years behind this week. It's starting this week, Melissa is telling me. Um, for Public Works Water, uh, Electric, and Sewer, the pre-construction meeting for the loop completion is March 25th, and construction should begin the first week of April, and yes, we will get out of your way for street fair. Um, electric pole inspections will begin mid-April. The company is named Alamon, and their employees will have identification showing their company name and have been instructed that if um, a, a resident has a question that they can tell them to call the village and, and we can confirm that they're with Alamon and also um, if a resident is uncomfortable with them being on their property and ask them to leave they will leave can we have some sort of geographic notification I mean is there I'm assuming that it's going um, to help do we know how long it's going to take I think it's going to take a month maybe, so maybe we weeks. could give 
you know, say just like, you know, we do even with the okay. hydrant flushing, hey, this part of town, look for these people. Okay, yeah, I can ask Johnny if he can maybe do that in some way. Um, speaking of hydrant flushing, we yes. will be doing that the second week of April. Um, so uh, Johnny will be putting a notice in the paper. He is also going to go ahead and rent those signs again because that seemed to work out really well uh, where we had the sign at, uh, I think it was at Limestone and Xenia. Um, they are going to be doing the storm line, uh, storm water line on Davis Street. Um, Wayne Cannon from RCAP will be here doing a training session with council on the rate analysis on Tuesday, April 7th from 7, to 8, 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Um, that time is approximate. Wayne will go for, uh, usually it takes about an hour, but if people ask extra questions, obviously it takes longer. Um, and except for the televisions, I think council room, chamber renovations are complete. Jerry, is that correct? The TVs? Uh, yeah, t well, if, <coughs> excuse me. TV and we'll probably have to do some repositioning of the, the cameras after we determine just how we're going to do that. Okay. And, um. and Brian probably will talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, the other thing is uh, you'll see in your packets the water and sewer rate survey, the 2015 water and sewer rate survey. We are not the highest, um, even on the combined bill, which is interesting. Um, and then you have the various reports from uh, Joe, the chief, Jason, um, and we're on to John. Thank oh, you. I have a question. What, what is the Davis Street? Uh, um, it's a stormwater line with two catch basins that's going to go from just the other side of Phillips Street um, down the opposite side, the, the north side of the street, um, and down to the where the manhole there's a manhole down there you can see and it will connect with the stormwater line that cuts over to limestone street so okay. it'll alleviate a lot of those stormwater issues over there we hope john cool uh yes my report um Last week was the Antioch Eco Village charrette. Um, attended several of the sessions there. I, I believe I saw every, every, all the council members there at some point, uh, which was great. Uh, their final um, report is online, uh, and I have the link to the YS News link uh, on the, uh, the report. Uh, I'm beginning the final uh, or final draft of the fee revision for zoning permits. And that is actually going to be something that will be uh, up for uh, review at the April Planning Commission meeting. Uh, and also to talk, we, we just uh, sent out the final uh, uh, agenda for the Planning Commission meeting. And that will include uh, two right-of-way vacations of requests from Antioch College, uh, as well as uh, a clerical rezoning for uh, it's Peach's property, which was uh, accidentally zoned conservation, and we we're trying to <laughs> rezone that back to B1. So that is a clerical issue that we're dealing with, as well as the permit fee revisions. Um, I've also begun to consolidate all of our property-related maintenance, uh, property maintenance-related uh, ordinances, uh, grass cutting, uh, abandoned building, so forth, into one document that I hope to have posted on our website. So. Uh, Property owners will under, will know uh, will have a one uh, have a source to go to find where uh, violations could occur, and then we can also use this document as a to help uh, when we're out in the field and we see uh, property maintenance violations uh, to follow up with those as well. Um, uh, we'll continue moving forward with the uh, Wi-Fi uh, for downtown. Last week um, we met with. Um, with uh, Superintendent Mario Basora from the school department and schools district. And uh, we had some pretty good conversations with that. It looks like Moveka is developing a new quote that hopefully will reduce the, pro the cost for that. In addition, we're looking at developing uh, some partnerships with some other uh, entities that are in, in the village. And John, can you just on that point mm -hmm. emphasize why the, the schools are interested in this project? 
The school's uh, interested in the project because uh, there's an opportunity to fulfill a goal of, of the schools, which is to uh, give internet access to uh, people all di different de income de and demographics uh, in the village. So this would be a, uh, this is a strategy to help increase the access of school students that are from disadvantaged communities, uh, disadvantaged populations to uh, have the same tools and access to other uh, populations and help them exceed and excel in, excel in schools. Uh, Thanks. Uh, so we're very excited to be working with them on that. Uh, and finally, um, as uh, Patty mentioned, we're getting two ICMF fellows who will arrive here on May 2nd. And uh, they have, I've also been, uh, additionally, <laughs> I've, been no I've been nominated and I've accepted to be an ICMF fellow in this program and I will be traveling to Malaysia in July. So that cool. will be happening. And so, so John, related mm -hmm. to that, I guess the, uh, the program plus what mm -hmm. Malaysia covers, covers the expenses for your? There's the, they, the uh, State Department and the ICMA program together provide the stipend and the airfare for, for the fellows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so. awesome. Great. And you would not have been able to participate if we weren't reciprocating, right? That's correct. Great. Thank you. Um, and congratulations. Thanks. Clerk's report. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't write anything down because it was really crazy in here with uh, a lot of sound things going on and drilling and banging and general frustration. So I didn't write anything down. It was really busy. There are tons of minutes, and it's otherwise sort of business as usual. Thank you. Uh, standing reports. Um, do you have anything to report uh, from Planning Commission, John? Was there? No, the Planning Commission did not meet for okay. March. And Judy, do we know when um, Regional Planning, Green County Regional Planning, is meeting? No. I, hmm, I have. Can you call? Can somebody I call? Yes, I will. Um, Ken. Ken LeBlanc and find out because they're in the process of deciding if they're going to move to Greene County or not. So it's an important meeting for somebody to attend. Okay. Uh, Jerry, Finance Committee. Um, I think within the packet, Melissa made some general comments or so forth. Um, or was it just in my packet? It's just you. Yeah, I'm very, I was trying to rip down through it. <laughs> See if I got it. Well, before I do that, um, <clears throat> the uh, I sent out uh, the, the code. I call it code of conduct, but rules and responsibilities. Rules and responsibilities to the library uh, commission that all those folks responded back that they didn't see a problem with signing it. So forth. So whenever it's it's uh, it's final. Uh, <clears throat> Mediation, of course, they're going to be working with uh, HRC, right? Uh, in, in their effort, and, and, and that is excellent training. I I took the training, so uh, I think they have 25 seats, if I'm correct. Yep. So uh, I, I, I think those in the community would learn a lot of it if they took that training. Uh, I was sick, did not make the uh, CR meeting. Can you report uh, about the CR? John meeting? can report on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the CR, um, CR met last Tuesday and um, basically uh, reviewed their um, their membership and uh, their positions and decided they're deciding how to move forward uh, in, in retrospective of the referendum. And I did was not able to stay for the entire meeting by another engagement, but that's what the gist of the meeting was when I was there. Melissa, was there anything in the financial report? Um, I think that it is just worth noting that I was able to split off. There's two. There's one new fund on there, and there's um, an existing one that was relabeled. Fund 215 was the furtherance of justice fund on the statement of cash position report. Um, we had federal and state monies in the same fund, and it needed to be separated. So I was able to successfully do that. So now we have a federal forfeited assets fund, which is 215. And then we have a state law enforcement trust fund, which is 216. Um, part of our supplemental appropriations when it comes time is I'll have to budget those accordingly because just 215 was budgeted for since the other one didn't exist. 
Um, there's two funds that um, are running negative fund balances, but they're not of concern. Solid waste fund, we don't account for the money that we're going to bring in for the year. We only account for the money that we're spending via encumbrances. So it looks like we're running a negative balance, but that fund is just on track. Um, that will continue to diminish throughout the year as we collect our revenues monthly. Water fund is also running a negative fund balance, but we've got the consultant fee for 225000 already encumbered, so that's kind of skewing things. Because um, I haven't done that transfer yet until we figure out exactly what we're doing with some of those water projects and everything. So um, I'll do a quarterly report next uh, at the second meeting in March. Okay. Well, and, and within that, we plan to have a few graphs so you can graphically see uh, what's happening and so forth. Okay. And one, one question that we had had earlier that I, I don't think I put in my report because I didn't know the answer at the time. Um, was if we do move that money out of the general fund to pay for the water projects and we just take the loan, can we put the money back into the general fund? And the answer to that is yes. Mm -hmm. So we, if we do have to move the, save the money to pay for the consultant and then we take the loan at the end of the project, we can put that money back into the general okay. fund. Okay. Um, Brian? Um, just one thing back on CR. <clears throat> I don't know who all got the email, but is, did somebody forward to them about the the link expiring? Judy, did you see that email? I did, and I didn't send it. Didn't okay. So do you mind forwarding that to, I don't know who the best, yeah. I guess Christine. Christine. But maybe if we have multiple emails, this will probably be good. Um, okay, so Charter Review Commission, um, I wanted to mention that we've had so far three meetings. Um, the second meeting, uh, we needed to kind of figure out sort of the uh, um, lay of the land in terms of home rule and, and how that applies. And once we got a lot of those questions answered, I feel that we're uh, on track. And our third meeting was uh, much more efficient. Uh, we're almost on schedule. And so I feel good about where we're going to uh, be and that we're going to finish in a timely manner. And uh, thanks to Chris and Amy for doing a lot of great work just to kind of fill in the gaps and make sure that everybody understands. We also have a great group that's really doing a good job of asking questions and analyzing. Since I noticed that it was on the agenda, an update, I'm not going to go into detail about major things. But I did want to throw out there, and maybe Judy can explain this best, one change that we pretty much have to make is going to affect when new council members are seated. And uh, Judy, do you mind just explaining it briefly? Yeah, no, that's fine. I got a heads up from the um, uh, Board of Elections that the way that we do it now actually doesn't give them time to verify account if there's a really close vote. So that we're sort of out of compliance in seating council folks. It's not been an issue because there have, haven't been any tight races, but um, we were told um, that we needed to get that change. So I think that the change is that it can be not before the first council meeting in December and then, and then not after the first council meeting in January is the, is the range. All right. And uh, so anyway, uh, Chris will be giving us more of a report so we have a heads up. And the plan is every month to just let council know what the major changes are so that we're prepared to sort of approve it all in the end and talk about that. Um, so in terms of Human Relations Commission, uh, I, I think we've hit most of it because, um, of course, we've got the community, community conversation coming up on Thursday. Uh, I did want to mention that uh, the HRC is going to approve it's 2015 goals that we will then recommend to council to take a look like other commissions have been doing. And uh, again, I wanted to mention that Cabba Davies is going to be uh, full time with the village. Uh, so working with John, working with HRC, working with community access during her spring co-op. So that's going to be awesome. Um, community access panel, uh, this um, is where, and. It didn't make it into the packet, but I'm going to read it out, but I thought it would be good to have it on paper. Um, but we were asked to make a recommendation uh, about how the man uh, station is going to be managed moving forward. And what I also tried to do in this process is, you know, we've talked about how do we formalize recommendations from commissions. 
moving forward just so we can be more effective. So I tried to come up with a sort of template for this. So I've got the recommendation, the council approve a paid station manager position for YS Community Access, which is channel five. I listed what I think are the relevant facts and issues. We confirm the numbers and there was also something in the packet that right now we're getting just over 40,000 in franchise fees from Time Warner. That's based on the highest amount we can get, which is 5% on all the user fees. Um, so they, because of uh, being able to use our equipment, we get that benefit and then that's part of how we run the station. Um, I think we've heard a little bit about our core volunteers, in particular, uh, Gene Payne and, and Paul Abendroth are wanting to step back because of other commitments that they have and, and they work pretty much full time. I mean, it's, it's a very labor intensive position. We haven't had any new volunteers step up. Um, I mentioned the workload. I got some ideas about what full time positions are. Uh, one local employer that's in the industry mentioned that a person that could do what we need uh, starting salaries range between 27 and 36,000 annual if it was full time. Keep in mind, I'm not necessarily thinking we'll do full time. And uh, somebody more of a network specialist, starting salaries of 35 to 40,000. And then uh, finally, we currently only spend about one to 2,000 a year, and that's to replace equipment and things like that. So we spend very little of the franchise fee that we get. Um, so a couple options that the community access panel came up with, contracting with an individual to just manage the station. So that would obviously be you know, a part-time hours. I'm not sure that we would form a part-time position, but it would not be 40 hours a week. Uh, another thought that's come up is to have an individual who can provide our IT support and run the station. Um, that could be more towards uh, full-time. Um, an interesting idea which was talked about was would WISO or Antioch College be interested in housing the station? Um, now obviously this would have to be you know, talked about with them, but the fiber does connect from Antioch to the village, so we could do all the same things. When are you there. expecting, are, I mean, are we gonna actually have this as an agenda item? I mean, this is a lot of, this is a lot to consider. Uh, I mean, we I've, can. Um, well, I guess I was thinking if, if we agree that we need to move forward, then Patty could start exploring it. But if you think that it, it's going to require more discussion. Well, what do you, I mean, I would like, because I have actually been in discussion with YSO about that conversation started two years ago. Uh -huh. So, I mean, we don't know if they're interested. So, sure. you know, to me, there's a big difference between that is something to be explored advertising for an employee and I don't even understand what you mean by contract with an individual do you mean in, hire an individual or do you mean hire an independent contract a contract worker so 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 are, are none of these are none of these options to hire an employee Th those were not options that came up so where this came about was community access panel was asked to come up with a recommendation and then we can decide if we need to discuss it more or if we agree that something needs to happen and, and pass it on to Patty is what I'm thinking. Um, and, and the question would be, you know, do, do we want to have, you know, hiring our own employee and so forth, uh, you perform part time? Uh, there are, ex, you know, expenses in uh, versus. Uh, having a contractor running. Right. I mean, you know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like we need to do something. I feel like this is a big decision and we don't have enough information to even begin this. You know, I, and I think Patty should be, I, I don't think contracting with an organization, I don't think that, I think that we can take that off. I think, I don't know that there's another organization out there, but I think that the Antioch College WISO definitely deserves right. investigation. Well, I, I need to understand, you know, what is involved with IT support. I mean, you know, what staff is looking for and, and what exactly would be involved. I mean, this is, you know, we're taking on a huge 
we're taking on forty thousand dollars you know any way this is any way this is is you know looked at what's probably a forty and that's twenty seven to thirty thousand or twenty seven to thirty six thousand dollars salary you put the benefits on top of it we're talking about somebody well the recommend sixty thousand dollars the recommendations debt. here were not for a benefit salary position that doesn't mean we can't look at those um, and then again this is a recommendation we, we need to take action so this is a good starting point I think if well we, I want the action we need is more information that's fine I mean I think I, yeah, I mean Marianne I, well I want to know what uh, the responsibilities of the manager would be it's here in the packet, in the okay. packet. I, I have it to me, it seems like it's more than IT. Well, I mean, see, I would right, think it would right. be. Yeah, and sure. and the, at one point, the village did pay on a contract mm -hmm. basis part right. time. Right. Because Patty right. Alice right. was in that position. So. Um, I guess I would add another fact that I did not include is that I feel that this is, you know, time sensitive. So, you know, if we want to make sure that we're continuing to broadcast meetings. Um, we do need to think about that. Um, and, and I mean, this is, if we're talking about negotiating with Antioch College and why so, that could take months. Well, maybe that's why it's not a viable option. These are just options that were brainstormed for us to get started. Well, I mean, I, I would like to look at it as, I would like us to consider short term and long term options. And, and so a short-term option could be some contracting with an individual. I don't, you know, I, I don't necessarily want that to be a commitment. You know, if there needs to be somebody to run the station, then, you know, we have to know how much that's going to cost and what exactly is involved. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and, 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 and I agree with you, Karen, but the thing that we must remember, you know, a, a lot of stuff that we got was by volunteers. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't have that anymore. So, but uh, we have good descriptions of what is required to run the station and so forth. And now it's a matter of fitting the body to that position and what it's going to cost us. And, you know, the, I, I also agree with you in terms of the white so You know, that may be a, a long-term goal, but uh, in, the, in the interim. We have to make sure that we have both the, uh, the, the coverage for our meetings and if we have a technical problem, we get that fixed. So. But I still don't understand what you're at. So, so, so is she going to look for a somebody to manage an, a contract individual? Patty going to look for a contract individual? I mean, I, I really don't understand. Um, are she going? Are we going to hire somebody? I really don't understand. No, well, well, again, Brian presented this, and at this point, if you, if council agrees that we should go forward, then the Cap, along with Patty, will, sit, will then sit down and determine how we, we fill the position and what the, the description should be and so forth. Um, well, we clearly need to do something. Yeah. So. So, I mean, I think the thing we've got to decide is do we, you know, first of all, do we agree that we've got to sort of move into paying someone versus, versus relying on volunteers? If we don't like the options that Community Access Panel came up with, we can tweak those. If we need to explore more, but we agree that we should, you know, think about paying someone to keep the station running. Well, I think it, it depends upon how much money we're talking about. I think I've thought for a long time that, yes, we probably do need to have, that it does make sense for somebody to be paid to run the station because there's a lot of work involved. Um, and But it really is a matter of what the hit to the budget's going to be. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sorry to be difficult, but I don't know if I'm telling Patty to um, hire somebody I don't know if I'm telling Patty to look for a contract. I, I just don't know what what we're what you're expecting. And um, I'm trying to address the issue, and and so well, I, I, I don't know. Could I? Yeah. Um, perhaps the the best solution in the short term 
is to look for a contract person to fill that position while we decide which way we want to go, whether okay. that be with why so or something. And, and that person could be, that contract could be paid out of the franchise fees, um, at least in the short term. Right. Because so, we have 41000 that's supposed to go towards running the yeah, it come, Yeah, it comes in and out in quarterly payments of different amounts, but it's approximately 40, 41000 So, I mean, that would be my suggestion if council's not sure how they want to proceed. Um, let's get somebody as a short-term contract person um, to do the appropriate meetings. And Has anybody we'll looked into the possibility that Miami Valley Communications Council could do it? I don't think that anybody's really looked no. anywhere yet anywhere because it's been I mean, I think that's the first place I'd start here in the right. last few days. Yeah. So that would be the first place I'd start with Miami Valley Communications Council. They could, they might be able to, to do it themselves. They have staff. They might be able to do it themselves. They'll charge us, but we're we're an associate member. There, we may be able to join, and you know so start with Miami Valley Communications Council. I mean, I'm all for, you know, having having it, you know, recognizing that there's a staff position required or a paid position um, that it's going to cost us some money. But, you know, to be presented with this and then be told that we have to make a quick decision, it's... I don't think, I mean, I think we can, you know, think about it as long as we want, but it sounds like if we go with Patty's recommendation, it's we agree that with the recommendation about a paid station manager we're focusing on option a so then the next thing would be to take these job descriptions and put them out there um, um well the, the thing you may want to consider about a contractor is and you need to remember that with a contractor you don't pay benefits right um and that is a huge cost savings um so which is i think why that was the recommendation. Right. Was contracting. That's that's usually a big part of why you go with a contract is because you don't normally pay anybody benefits on that. And but, I mean, is it? I guess I would need to check to see if it's. Right. My understanding about contract is that if they're doing most of their work in a facility, that it it can't be contract. That you have to pay. You have to withhold. They can't be considered a contract employee because they're doing the bulk of their work in a single facility. They're working essentially for the village. Are you saying that through the council? No, through, I mean, that that's IRS rules, isn't it? No, they, no. they can work on site. The question is at whose direction, one of the key factors is at whose direction is that independent contractor working? Right. And so if they're here and they're, they're running this and We've got through the Miami Valley Regional Cable Council. I, I think that they could be an independent contractor. I don't think there would be an issue with that. Well, uh, let, let's do this. Let's short term get someone in here while we decide how we want to proceed, and then we can start investigating the other options of uh, you know, doing it as a contract, permanent contract, doing it as a, uh, an employee of, of some type. Um, you know, do, do we want to combine things? Can we combine things? Do they, you know, people do both of those? Okay. So and and you I will, will, somebody will talk to Miami Valley Communications I will. Council. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I have and we haven't met with them once, so. I have any questions. Um, there are two, two positions listed here, the manager and the program dir uh, director. Are we saying we need to hire two positions or what's the program director? Well, I think for the short term, it'd be appropriate for one person to do both if uh, until we figure out exactly what we want to do. And do we know, uh, is there a sense of how many hours we're talking about? I'd have to get with uh, Brian and Jerry. I think yeah. they've done most of the research into this. I mean, I think th we're going to try to do the minimum, yeah. I guess, uh, and, and just see what, what we is can that? It's just it's providing the, the standard service. The, and, uh, you know, and, and it's, when you got volunteers, it's, it's kind of hard to, to figure, but we'll, we'll come up with, with how many hours of those volunteers are working on it. So, so you basis. have that yet to determine? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, it's all kind of in my mind, a recommendation that we've got to kind of think about. And my last question is, how critical is this uh, station? 
for us. I say that, I know it sounds well, I, odd, but I never watch it. I think a lot of people, this is how they watch council meetings, to be honest with you. Um, either this or, or, or on YouTube, I think, so I think that it's probably fairly important. And, and I think, I mean, I think it's possible that if, if we go online and it becomes more streaming and it mm -hmm. becomes, but we're, then maybe we can, but then, we'll, but then, you know, I'm not sure about the, 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 the fees, the cable access fees, if we, I guess we still get those just from, right. Until, allowing, until, yeah. Until, uh, right but, now, but it's possible that. that we won't need an actual station. I mean, maybe we won't have an actual channel five. Maybe it will all just be online, but we still need a camera operator and we still need somebody to edit, you know, to, to put things on the computer. So there's always going to be somebody. Even Uploading if there's, to YouTube. Right. I mean, I think that we're, I feel like we're obligated to provide the, the service and the information and the meetings being recorded and things, access, whether it's on TV or whether it's on the computer, I think. But um, my understanding is that the station runs programming, what, during the daytime anyway? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it fills in with community uh, events and things. Mm -hmm. But I, d I have no idea how many people watch it. If we're only doing it basically to videotape uh, council meetings and planning commission or some things like that, that's a pretty small thing. If we want it really to be more inclusive of the community, that's a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to make that decision. Well, I mean, it seems to me that that, that our first goal should be that we, I, I feel like we're obligated to show these, to film and make these videos available, whether it's CDs and at uh, least for of, the time being, meetings. yes, of our meetings, yes. of planning well, commission, of BZA. I mean, I would certainly like the meetings. I hope the meetings, this, the rest of the meetings this week are going to be filmed. Yeah, we have, we're covered this week. I don't actually know um, if this meeting's going to get up on YouTube, for example. Um, but, you know, we do have Wednesday and Thursday covered. So, I mean, so at a minimum, I think that needs to happen. And, and it, you know, for now it should be on TV because we haven't told people we're going to change. So it's, to me, it should be on Channel 5 and our, with our goal to get everything online. And then at that point we decide, are we going to have a TV channel or not? And then I agree with you, Marianne, then that's to me when working with WISO, working with the college, working with a bigger organization starts to make sense. If you're starting about broad, starting to look at broader programming, um, should we do that alone? Does it make sense? Probably not. Um, but that's when it becomes, you know, a broader project. I don't think, I don't personally don't think we have to worry about that right now. I think it's a conversation to be. This is part of what the International Fellows are doing, part of their project. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, because it's we we keep on saying social media, but it's really our online presence. Mm -hmm. oh. Social media is just a, a subset of that. Right. I, um, I mean, I like that. I mean, I like that idea, and just to look at at this too, at, right. at how this is. Right. So yeah. I mean, so this definitely wasn't me meant to be overwhelming. It was more just this was what was brainstormed, and then we need to start thinking about doing something. I, I think Patty needs, I mean, I think there's no question, Patty needs to find somebody, cable access, whoever needs to find somebody to start to be available to film meetings as right. next week. And then I would, I would imagine knowing Patty that she's going to be judicious about those funds. I mean, there's an argument that should 41,000 be spent on this, but I mean, I know that that's not where, where we're going to start. Right. So we're going to cover what we need and Okay. Public art. Okay. Yeah. Public okay. art. Um, so, Public Art Commission already talked about the nominations for the uh, Village Design Award, the VITA. And um, they're actually, we were not <coughs> able to meet uh, this past month. So, no major updates otherwise. Okay. Mary Ann? Um, I was not at the energy board meeting. But oh this yes, guy was. so I was supposed to say um, that was a great meeting actually. Uh, a lot of work being done on getting ready for the April 20th uh, presentation. Uh, and um, so going through some of the details and questions, I suggested two things. One, to 
not get too detail oriented and focus more on, you know, just kind of what are we going to be able to understand about the value proposition and that sort of thing. And I also emphasized the idea of, of collaboration. Uh, you know, that's an important part of what the energy board's doing with village staff and council. Okay. So the environmental Steven. commission. Did you did you meet okay. with Stephen? School board, do you have anything on that? I did no, I didn't meet with him this time. I think I reported okay. the last no, I didn't meet with Steve. Um, the environmental commission we uh, talked about the wellhead protection plan and Joe Bates is gonna come to our meeting actually tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not clear what the role of the Environmental Commission should be, and given that there have been issues with the Environmental Commission, you know, wh what does a commission council needs to tell the Environmental Commission what it suggests the role be, it be, or the Environmental Commission at our meeting tomorrow can discuss with Patty and Joe what we think makes sense for our role to be and come back to council and say this is what we see. Right, and, and uh, Joe will be there, but I have the other meeting, the, the combined health district meeting. So. so so my question really is, does council want the environmental commission to discuss how, how it sees its role in moving the wellhead protection plan forward and come back to council and say, this is what we think we should be doing? Or does council want to tell the environmental commission what it thinks? I think council or I think yeah. environmental yeah. commission should make a proposal of what they want to do that we have to okay. discuss. But you know, right now that plan lies with Joe. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. So to me, Joe and Patty should say what type of support they need from them to get it going. Well, yeah, I, yeah. I think yeah. the way that Joe and I envision it is that the Environmental Commission has a lot of people on it that have a lot of expertise, particularly Jessica <coughs> in this particular instance, yeah. which is why she was kind of given the, that. And I think that that's where Joe and I see that coming in. I mean, where they can maybe collaborate on, on what has changed and how we can address those things. And so I think that kind of expertise and input and uh, as you know I suggested a format similar to what we're using for charter review and for um, of taking the personnel piece. yeah, yeah. And, and if it could be a joint kind of a joint proposal that that Joe and, and Patty are having input into that would you know that would pretty much make it much easier for council because we wouldn't have to look to staff and say proposal yeah, it, that staff and the commission yes right council. and and so maybe you guys can I I won't be there tomorrow night but maybe you can discuss that with Joe and then Joe and I can meet with you maybe and okay so everybody's on the same page okay and um, we're in the process of developing annual goals the wellhead protection plan I anticipate is going to it's going to take a long time. It's going to take maybe a year, maybe two years. I, I don't know, but it's a hefty document. Um, and then each person on the commission is being the sort of spearhead for one particular task. So Jessica D'Ambrosio, who is a hydrologist at the college, and she's at the college. And um, we did review the rules, the documents that Brian and I worked on, along with the um, public service values and our committee felt uh, okay about that. Um, Deward, Headley uh, reviewed the design of the flow device for the glass farm and discussed that, well, the, that, it, that it does not or should not have any negative impact or positive really if there is a high water issue. Mm -hmm. And he also was in the process of figuring out how much uh, uh, total capacity is taken up by the water that's standing, which is, he figured, about 3% or so. Uh, he, he, he hasn't come up with a solid figure about that. So, so just theoretically, he was working on what impact the mm -hmm. flow device would have. I actually walked over there today to look. And um, we talked uh, about Ellis Pond briefly. Um, that I, I had walked that with Macy Reynolds and Patsy Perry to look at where it made sense to just keep it naturalized. Um, 
Nadia Malarkey is, is going to be working on a training for the staff uh, for pesticide alternatives on village property. And then we're interfacing with the climate action planning group. And we will, I will bring the issue of the green space fund to the environmental commission. We haven't talked about that. So that's a report of our last meeting. Okay, thanks. Um, the chamber, we have a, a lunch and learn this coming Thursday here in A and B um, about social media. Um, lunch will be provided and it's being provided thanks to Ertl Publishing. Um, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, um, we actually had Jerry Ray, who's the director of ODOT at our last meeting, which was like kind of unheard of. Everybody was like shocked that he was there. and. You know, everybody's up and armed. I mean, there is a horrible problem with, with highway funding. Um, there's just not enough money in the trust fund. The feds won't put more money in. And so, you know, highway, the certainty for highway funding is, is a real problem. Um, a couple of weeks, a week, I think earlier in the week, I had actually attended a meeting with um, Congressman Mike Turner and every, it was a mayor's and, and meeting and everybody there, you know, was talking about the fact that, um, that the feds need to let loose with money. I mean, when we're talking about, you know, probably a room of a lot of Republicans and they were saying that they need to let loose with money and we need, we need infrastructure investment. And, you know, I specifically asked him if he would support um, President Obama's plan for um, infrastructure funding and <laughs> yeah. you're a brave woman. Yeah, he just kind of just kind of looked and but at least I got it out there. Hmm. So um, let's see um, future agenda items. I don't think the only thing we have that we brought on I think is um, the utility policy again mm -hmm. for next time. Um, I assume we may have something on this cable situation, do you think? Um, I would hope, so. well, I mean, it depends on how much research I can can get done. I mean, we're gonna, we'll have, we should have a contract person of some type, but um, okay. so you might have something to do with the contract person. Um, sidewalk policy discussion, so is, that says April, is that gonna be the first meeting in April? Well, the sidewalk policy discussion council decided to put it off until you make a decision on the delinquency. Remember, we decided one big issue at a time. Okay, so. Um, so what do we have at the next meeting? Well, we'll figure so it out. Uh, when are we going to bring back roles and responsibilities in the draft ordinance for the commissions? The latter seems to be less controversial. Um, well, it looks like at this point we don't have much on this agenda. So, um, do you want to add it to this one? What is it? Yeah. What the fifth is that? What's the date? Six. Judy? Six. 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 Okay. So that's the draft roles and responsibilities, Brian. Is that what you? Yeah, we should probably just do one at a time. So it's either bringing back roles and responsibilities or the draft ordinance, which, you know, regularizes all the terms and everything. So, um, I mean, this is from you and Marianne, you guys decide what you want to do. Have I seen a copy of the draft ordinance? Yes. Okay. And I'll send it to you again. If you, well, yeah. I, I, it was about two weeks ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we do the, the ordinance? Okay. So okay, that so that doesn't seem to be controversial. Yeah. Mission ordinance. That sounds good. Okay. Okay. And it doesn't look like we have much more on there. I, I'm sure something will happen and get on the agenda. Yeah, but that, you know, because it, it appears we only have one group that's really opposing that. Yes, and I had yeah. some thoughts about that, and I'm going to come yeah. to the HRC but, meeting. Uh, no, we can't let one commission hold this house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, can I get a motion to go into executive session for a discussion of potential litigation with our attorney president? So moved. Second. Judy, would you please call the roll? Wintrow. Yes. Sims. Yes. Housh. Yes. McQueen. Yes. Do we need a little bit of?